speak at today's meeting. Under the discussion items, there is an added item uh, 8.7 with respecting the 2013 HECFI operating budget. This is a report that was emailed to members of the committee on, on Friday for your review prior to today's meeting, but is also attached to the changes to the agenda this morning. And also the HECFI contract negotiations is a verbal update respecting Global Spectrum and Carmen's. This can be added as item 8.8. .8. It was on the agenda as a private and confidential, but it has been moved from that area and moved up to the discussion agenda. Now, under the private and confidential, there is an item which is postponed to a future meeting, which is item 12.7, respecting litigation national steel car. An item is removed, which is the um, HECFI contract negotiations verbal update on Global Spectrum and Carmen's, which is now 8.8. .8. .8. And there is an item added to the P&C items respecting our voice, our Hamilton. This can be added as item 12.9. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Councillor Clark, you had a question? Uh, yes, I do, uh, Madam Deputy Mayor, on item C with regards to uh, P.J. Mercanti appearing before us. Can we get some clarification in terms of what the intention is? It looks to me as though it's, he's going to add his enlightened elucidation in regards to economic and social benefits of the entertainment destination. We're still trying to find out exactly what the casinos are that they're proposing. We still haven't seen any hard facts in terms of what they're proposing. and. I'm a, I'm a little bit troubled that we're going to have a debate on another debate on another debate about the philosophy of gaming that the province did and made the decision. I, as a councillor, I just want to know what the proponents are offering. It's really getting ridiculous. So I don't know if the city manager or someone has spoken to PJ. Do they have any idea what they're proposing? Because right now... I'm not too keen on having him come tell, tell me about the economic and social benefits of an entertainment destination. Councilor Farr did that the first meeting we had. I'll ask the city manager if he can answer that question, Councilor. Uh, so you, uh, Madam Chair, the, uh, I have not spoken with, uh, with PJ on this matter at all, so, uh, and I know Tim has uh, uh, some comments to make about this. Um, Madam Deputy Mayor, my understanding is that the PJ Mercanti uh, Consortium, including investors and a casino operator, are proposing to give all the details, uh, hopefully at the February 6th GIC, regarding a specific uh, casino uh, proposal. So, I'm trying to, under, it's just, I'm sorry, Mr. Madam Deputy Mayor, just take this up, but it's a bit of a process issue here. So I'm trying to understand how this works. Councillor, sorry, Mr. Mayor, you're the chair of the gaming committee, subcommittee. So would those proponents be appearing before your committee and then coming here normally, or is it that committee's wish that they come here? Because I, I, I'd like us to follow the right process. Through you, Madam Deputy Mayor, the subcommittee uh, was really formed to uh, work on a set of conditions that council would apply to proponents, suggested conditions that... Yes. Okay. This looks apart from that work, and uh, I wouldn't see the relationship for the subcommittee's work to what's being presented here. So your preference would be that we come here? Well, through you, Madam Deputy Mayor, I... I it sounds to me like for a future meeting that we will be given information about a project that's going to be proposed and I don't see why we wouldn't entertain that but not at the subcommittee level because that work is basically done. So. I'm just rem I'm seeing March 1 flying through my eyes as, as time goes on here. We want to make sure that we get everything done in time so that would be coming here then and it's not about the general benefits of gaming. He's going to beginning. He's going to present a proposal from Carmen's Entertainment Group, Mr. McKay. Mr. Deputy or Madam Deputy Mayor, that's my understanding, and I do believe it's uh, it's something that the uh, full GIC should hear. Thank you, um, and uh, would encourage that. Thank you. Second uh, question, if I may, Madam Deputy Mayor, 
We just received this contract this morning. I thank the city manager for making sure that we received it. It's some 84 pages in length for the contract itself. There's another 17 to 25 pages for biographies. And then after that, I'm not even sure what's there. Um, so I'm trying to understand what we're doing this morning. We're going to be asking questions of the proponent that caused the small ruckus in the paper, but we've just received this today. How will I get the opportunity to read the contract to know the ins and outs of what's in there prior to making any decision on the proponent? Madam Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Murray. Uh, to you, Madam Chair. Um, number of things obviously are moving quite fast. We're trying to put as much information uh, in your hands uh, as possible uh, using both uh, you know, uh, the public session as well as the in-camera session. So um, I think uh, subject to you agreeing to uh, hear from the presenter, um, I think we'll want to, uh, uh, our, our uh, city solicitor, our acting city solicitor will will likely want to suggest that we do go on camera to provide you some advice as to uh, what questions we might want to ask or not ask the uh, the consultant should you accept them making a presentation. Uh, I recognize what you're saying. This is a rather lengthy uh, RFP submission that you have in front of you and the ability to go through that many pages in you know, such a short time is virtually impossible. Um, but there is some uh, contextual information there that we may draw to your attention uh, should we go in camera to talk about the merits of the contract and what our advice is for going forward uh, with respect to uh, 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 this, uh, this consulting firm. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, I don't expect you to be able to read it all, but uh, I think we will be able to, though, uh, if we get permission to go in camera to discuss some aspects of it and provide some advice to you today uh, as to uh, how we're going to move forward with this matter. My apologies, uh, Madam Deputy Mayor. So we're going to hear from the proponent, have an opportunity to ask questions of the proponent. Can I ask questions of the proponent about the contract prior to going in camera, or would that have to wait until we go in camera? Morning. Perhaps I can answer that, uh, Madam Deputy Mayor, through you to the member. Um, my suggestion would be, since you're going to hear more information, you're going to hear the delegation from the proponent, you're going to hear a public presentation from staff, and we are going in camera to discuss the issue fulsomely after that. Um, you treat the delegation uh, much like you would at a planning meeting, a public meeting of the planning, under the Planning Act. You hear the delegation, you ask factual questions, uh, you don't try and get into a debate or engage with them in any great detail. Uh, you get that information, you then hear the staff presentation, we then go back in camera, and then you can make your decision if any decision that flows from that. So it's really just a matter of hearing them out, hearing what they have to say, and getting more information uh, that you might need. Um, Madam Deputy Mayor, that's a close analog, except we have an application before us at planning where I can actually reference things in it. Is there any reason why this contract is, is uh, confidential? Why is the contract in camera? public contract with the city of Hamilton? Um, it's, well, again, I think it's, it's, it's some contextual information for, uh, to be, uh, I think, used uh, when we discuss uh, what transpired in the last week. And um, in terms of whether or not we can release it, uh, I suspect we should be able to. Uh, but uh, just I'll defer to our acting city solicitor to get some advice on that particular matter. Well, Madam Deputy Mayor, I haven't been able to go through the entire document, regardless of what is the substance of the document. If it's a contract with the City of Hamilton and is already signed, then it should be a public document at that point. Uh, yes, actually, through you, Madam Deputy Mayor, I actually agree with that. I think the intent probably was, as, as uh, the City Manager said, to give you contextual information for an in-camera discussion. But uh, the reality of it is a public document, and it certainly mm -hmm. is able to be released whenever you choose to do so. So I, I can't speak to it since I have been speaking to it. So I think Councillor Marula indicated he would move the motion to make it a public document, and I would second that. Madam Deputy Mayor? I did have a speaker's list, okay. so I and that's all deal with questions. this now. But Councillor yes, Ferguson, did you have an issue with regards to this item? No. Okay, thank you. I just want to be sure I'm not crossing over because you were next on the speaker's list. I think Councilor it's an opportune Marula? time to release it. So I'll move that's that we fine. make it That's fine. You're going to move that this be released, second by Councillor Clark. 
Question, Councillor Jackson. Yes, sir. So, Madam Deputy Mayor, I understand uh, where, where my two colleagues are coming from, um, but if there's hypothetically some different course of action, hypothetically from today's meeting, I mean, I would love the ability to at least have that discussion in camera only because hypothetically I don't want to potentially expose the corporation. I just don't even know what range of options might be, so I'm just, I just need to hear from the city manager and or uh, the acting solicitor, Mr. Fisher, and or the mover and seconder of the motion. I think we all want to get to where the motion's going ultimately, but I'd like to as well protect on behalf of the taxpayers whatever final decision we may make, Madam Deputy Mayor. So, on, that, on that point, Madam Thank Chair? you, Madam yeah. Deputy Mayor. Can Those are my concerns. Thank you. Trying to see if we can streamline this. We're still, the intent is that we're going in camera on information, correct, Mr. Fisher, Mr. Murray? So that's not, the motion was moved only to make this document public. That's correct. That's all we're so doing. we are going in camera. And we are going in camera. So maybe I can short that. list the number of concerns that are being raised. Is that okay? So can I now go on to the speakers list? I have Councillor Ferguson and Councillor Partridge. Councillor Partridge, was it on this or on this issue? Your indulgence? Okay. Uh, Councillor Partridge, because on this issue? Yes, and thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Uh, my question through you to staff, either legal or the city manager. Uh, are our consul uh, consultant contracts, are they not public documents or do we treat all of them the same way and keep them confidential until someone asks for them to be released around the council table? Just for clarification, please. Don, I think it's you. Uh, I'll I'll try. I don't know the exact procedure. Um, my, in my understanding, there's no reason they couldn't be released, whether or not they actually are in every case. I don't know uh, at, at what time they're posted, or for example. Um, this is a rather large document. Sometimes uh, they get put up there, sometimes they don't. In theory, uh, there is no reason it could not be when you choose. And again, I repeat, I think the only reason it's it's uh, here on red paper today is that it was supposed to serve as contextual information for an in-camera discussion that we're going to have on it. And it, as you know, it is appropriate in t at certain times to keep information that's otherwise public uh, in camera if it's part of an in-camera discussion. On the other hand, for all I know, this could have been released already and there certainly wouldn't be any reason not to do that. So. And, and uh, thank you, through Madam Deputy Mayor. And I don't dispute that. We're going in camera, and I'm, and I'm fine with that. I'm just wanting some clarification. Is this how we would normally treat every consultant's contract? It just seems odd that we're dealing with it around this table. So I'm, I'm not seeing any response to that. Email. City Manager? If I can, okay. uh, Madam Chairman, I mean, there are circumstances, as you would know, um, where there is proprietary information that is contained within an RFP. So, I mean, there may be circumstances that uh, that would uh, limit to what it is that we are able to put in public, but I don't believe in this particular case that would apply. But uh, I think hearing from Mr. Mail would be important. Thank you. Uh, through you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Um, we do not sign separate contracts with consultants as, as a normal recourse. Uh, normally the contract for consulting is formed uh, by a combination of the request for proposal that's issued, the submission from the consultant, and then the purchase order that's issued. So the purchase order, the request for proposal are public documents. Typically in the request for proposal it will state that the proposal submitted by a firm is subject to MFIPA, which is the Municipal Freedom of Information. Uh, because there are such things in there that the firm would consider proprietary, such as hourly rates and unit prices, that sort of thing. Uh, so that was included in this document, and that's why in earlier discussions we had said that uh, the document itself said that the submission from the consultant would be subject to MFIPA as per the request for proposal. All right, thank you. So what I'm hearing then is that within this document, this lengthy document, some of the information in here is proprietary, so that's fine. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Councillor Clark answered. So on this item then, I'm just going to call for, it was moved and seconded 
that the, that the report be released to the public. All in favor? Yes. Carried. Thank you. Councillor Ferguson, thank you for your indulgence and being patient. You're welcome. Uh, through you, if I can, and Mr. McKay, back to the uh, P.J. Mercanti correspondence. Uh, you mentioned during the answering of uh, a previous question that uh, a number of proponents may be coming for GIC, and personally I would find that very informative. I'd like to hear all sides. I'd like to have the whole debate to be balanced so that uh, we can make an informed decision. So is the letter from P.J. Mercanti and the fact that they're coming before GIC one and the same thing? Or is there something different that he wants to come before a committee on? Uh, Madam Deputy Mayor, I'm not sure I can answer or I, okay, if I understand the question, but I think it's the same thing. They want to appear at a full GIC to let the council, let the committee know about their their specific plans uh, for uh, for a casino. So just to be clear, they don't want to appear twice then. They just want to come in on the one time when everybody else comes At in. this point, they're, they're only asking to come this time. Okay. Madam Chair, I think uh, maybe Mr. McCanty was just trying to be prudent to make sure he was on a future agenda when we do talk about this. So I don't have any issue with approving this as, as, uh, as a delegation, providing they come at the exact same time as everybody else and we can hear their presentations. Uh, well, I can ask that to you, Madam Chairman, to Mr. Cape. Are, are, are this coming? I'm not aware of anybody else that has indicated a, a desire to present at this point. Okay, but I would still like to hear from anybody who wants to come before us, and maybe with publicity out there from this particular discussion, others will appear. So uh, I have no trouble approving him for a future GIC meeting. Thank you. No other questions, comments? Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the agenda as amended? I apologize. Uh, Madam Clerk, you had an addition with regards to an in-camera. Yes, my apologies. There is an additional private and confidential item which I was advised of this morning to do with a personnel, personal matters about an identifiable individual. Thank It'll you. be item 12.9. Correct. Okay, so with that addition, all in favor of the uh, agenda as amended? Carried. Thank you, everyone. Now, members of committee, are there any declarations of interest today? Seeing none, members of committee... May I have, um, okay, Councillor? Yes, uh, sorry, okay. sorry, Deputy Mayor. Um, I'm just thinking that on the one to do with licensing, I believe I need to declare a conflict with the master's licensing portion of it only. Thank you. Madam Clerk, we'll so note that. And Councillor Ferguson? What, yes, it, is, I, I missed it. Is there a licensing issue uh, before us today? It's a report with regards to fees. Um, Attached to another report? Tell me, can I, Mr. I, I don't know of a licensing issue that's before us today. There's I didn't nothing see with it. regards to that. Well, that's to, on tomorrow. Is it not a planning? Yes. It's a planning, yes. Yeah, it's, on a so. planning yeah, it's on planning yeah, committee. It's on planning tomorrow. I read all the reports at once. I don't know why I respect that because we all read the reports. So uh, if everyone liked me over the weekend. Okay, so moving on, the members of the committee, you have before you several sets of previous general issues committee meeting minutes. May I have a motion to approve the minutes? Okay, I'm just going to say 3 1, 3 2, 3 3, 3 4, 3 5, which are November 27th. And 21 and 27, December the 5th, December 7th, December 7th, December 11th. And it's moved by Councillor Collins, seconded by Councillor Whitehead. Questions, Councillor Whitehead? No? Uh, four. I just want to be clear uh, approving the minutes is not necessarily approving or adopting the, uh, the no. substance of the report. No, sir. Thank you. No. Thank you. All in favor? Carried. Thank you, everyone. Members of committee, you have before you several delegation requests and. Um, I'm going to ask in what is the committee's pleasure with respect to item 4.1. It's a request from Evelyn Myrie on behalf of the Hamilton Center for Civic Inclusion to provide report and request for funding for HCCI. Councillor Whitehead moves. Councillor McCaddy seconded. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Committee's pleasure with respect to item 4.2. Request for Stuart True, trained campaigner, Council of Canadians, respecting Canada-EU trade agreement. Move them all. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, Madam Clerk, you have all that. We'll move all of the items then. 4.1 to 4.5, inclusive. Uh, for 4.5, I will also require a motion to suspend the rules of order to allow Ms. McCallum to right. speak today. Okay. Inclusive of that direction then. All of, moved by Councillor Powers, second by Councillor 
Johnson? Okay. All in favor? Carry. Thank you, everyone. Members of the committee, you have before you consent items 51 to 517 inclusive and 519 to 521 inclusive. Uh, and advised by, as advised by the committee clerk, item 518 has been withdrawn. Are there any items listed on the consent agenda which you, which you wish to bring up to a discussion? Councillor Johnson. Uh, not for discussion, Deputy Mayor. It was just really for 5.5. I really wanted to thank the uh, city manager and Heather Donaldson for uh, putting this together. This was something that when I first came on, I wanted to, to drive this one home. And thank you very much. It's regarding the developing an environmental roundtable for Hamilton citywide. So here, here, and I'm looking forward to the, uh, the event. And if you need any support or anything you need from me, let me know. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Councillor Ferguson, did you... Uh... No, Councillor Partridge. Yes, thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. On um, on the minutes of the uh, Habia 5.2a, there was a discussion item on page two that referred to the CPP uh, program and that they're going to have some presentations and discussion. And I'm wondering through you if I could just ask the city manager to comment on his recent... Um, presentation up at the Flamborough Chamber of Commerce and there were there were uh, two issues that pertain to the CPP that came to the table. The community was quite upset about it and I'm wondering if perhaps through this we could have, uh, I'm not sure what the process would be, but to, to maybe have it go to AF and A. Maybe you go to the of CPP. Oh, okay, thank you. He doesn't yeah. know anything about it. Yeah. So I'm Councillor Whitehead and uh, Chris Murray have indicated they'd like to comment on it. I just don't want to see this fall off the table. Okay, I'm going to go to the city manager first. I uh, see you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, Councillor Partridge is right. Uh, I did attend a, uh, a presentation uh, similar to what I did at the Chamber of Commerce a few months ago, uh, highlighting some of the progress that we're making and challenges that we face here at City of Hamilton. The, the, the questions that uh, ensued uh, related to some of the procedural matters that we have here uh, in terms of, um, you know, the complexity of getting permits to host, uh, you know, whether they be Rib Fest events or they be Santa Claus parades, you know, the things that really kind of help to define this community um, and are in culture and important. So, um, there seems to be maybe some opportunity, I think, to uh, look at our process to see whether or not there are some things that we might be able to do to uh, make it easier for you know volunteers to uh, uh, to host these events and uh, and not uh, you know complicate their lives any more than necessary. So that was the spirit of which I took the the concerns that were being expressed. And, uh, and Councillor Partridge and I have had some chance to, to talk about this and and uh, and I guess what what we're really saying at the end of the day is there a chance for a few of us to sit down and and look at uh, what it is that we might be able to do to make this as easy for people as possible while still protecting the interests of the city of Hamilton yes and thank you and I think Tim McCabe did you want to uh, through you madam deputy mayor no okay so I just want to be clear it's strictly on the process it's not about increasing the amounts of funding it's not about anything to do with the budgetary amounts around that the particular um, challenges that, that were brought to the attention of Mr. Murray and myself in a very public way, uh, rightly so, were to do with the, the whole process of the application. So I just, I appreciate that comment. I'm not sure what the proper process is, but, you know, perhaps as, as Councillor Power said, it uh, certainly needs to be brought to the attention of the people responsible for it. Thank you. Thank you. And I have a speaker's list. Councillor Jackson. Councillor Whitehead, Councillor Clark, Councillor Powers. Thanks, uh, Madam Deputy Mayor. So I just have a couple of items. Go ahead, Councillor. Thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. Happy New Year, everyone. Um, thank you. Um, Madam Deputy Mayor, I have a couple of items. So should I do one at a time or should I do one first and see if anybody else wants to speak and then get to the other or how would you like to proceed with this? I'd suggest given, speaking to the items that you had concerns with, and we'll deal with those, those reports. Okay. Madam Chair, my, my subject matter was the one that was just talked okay. about, so uh, it's to this More point. than willing to relinquish, okay. Councillor Whitehead. Please keep me on the list, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank so you. So of all the speakers then, thank you, Councillor Jackson. Are there others wishing to speak to this particular item? Thank Councillor. Okay. So 
Councillor Jackson, if I will have you hold off then. I'll go next on the speaker's list, then Councillor Whitehead, on this, on this item. Correct. I, I want to thank Councillor Partridge for bringing it forward. I know that certainly at Habia there was a pretty extensive discussion. And the discussion, and I, I did have a brief discussion with uh, uh, Mike Zagarek as well. Uh, it's clear that uh, the paperwork that, uh, that a lot of these organizations have to embark on is uh, somewhat cumbersome and repetitive. And a lot of the information already exists within the city files, so the question is how can we streamline these process, processes to uh, make it uh, a lot easier for the, uh, uh, for the interested parties that are making applications. And I know that uh, uh, that discussion is ongoing and I'm hoping to see uh, a resolution and certainly was raised uh, initially at the, uh, the Havia meetings. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Clark. Madam Deputy Mayor, uh, on the exact same item, I don't think there was confusion with the Stony Creek BIA, um, the expectation of what transpired and what was supposed to happen was not congruent. Um, the actual cost they incurred um, over the Christmas season, they got a big bill from the police department. We love the police department, you know, um, but it was a bill that was far and away more onerous than they had anticipated or budgeted for. So something has changed in terms of the costing. Um, and I need direction from yourself or the mayor in terms of who I would speak to to have that matter reviewed to make sure that there wasn't an error. How do I get the BIA's cost for Stony Creek on their Santa Claus parade reviewed with a mindset of what they were paying the year before and how it changed so dramatically and who made that decision? Because it was not something that I was aware of. It kind of shocked me too, as I know it shocked you. Thank you, Councillor. And I, uh, I, I agree. I know I was at a meeting, and I'm not, I don't mean to jump in, but I was at a meeting with Canada Flag Day Parade uh, last week, and they had similar issues. I was yep. going to raise them with the uh, chairman of the CCP committee, uh, CPP committee, with regards to the grant and the funding, uh, where I thought would have been most appropriate. I had hadn't planned on raising it here today, so I'm not sure if Councillor Parlers wishes to speak to this because I know you're on the speaker's list with regards to the process from that committee. And maybe that would be the initial direction, Councillor Well, perhaps what we, I could suggest is I could meet with Councillor Powers and, and that particular committee and any staff that Correct. works with that committee and then they can help clarify exactly what happened. Um, I'm getting it bits and pieces. I, I want all the documents to come in from um, the committee and then, and then go to Councillor Powers' committee and perhaps we can sort out exactly what did happen and how we can fix it. Stony Creek Santa Claus Parade Committee is not complaining about it. They're simply bringing it to our attention that this is what's happened and they're hoping to fix it so it, does it, so it doesn't happen again. Thank you. I will go to Councillor Powers on, in the next on the speaker's report. list. Maybe he can shed some light on this also. Thank you very much. There is indeed a review of the CP pro process being under uh, under Danker and under Mr. Zagarek and Mr. and Ms. Bradford's uh, leadership. Uh, if there are issues out of courtesy, I ask that you share them with the chair of the, the committee soonest so that we conclude those in the uh, in the discussions. But uh, yes, there uh, there will be a new CPP program for our discussion and our consideration, uh, likely in the spring. Thank you. As Madam Deputy Mayor, uh, Anna Bradford can help out with this in terms of the uh, this, the uh, process can be uh, information from the seat process. So Anna can help out with this information and how this happened too. So. And we can deal with that at subcommittee at the committee level. Thank you. Is that all right, everyone? Okay, thank you. Now I will turn to Councillor Jackson on the other items, sir. Thank you for your patience. Thanks, Madam Deputy Mayor. Fascinating. Um, item 5.5. Madam Deputy Mayor, um, I, like Councillor Johnson, support this environmental roundtable. I just read through it, and it just seems to me that um, it's mostly for people and organizations that are plugged in uh, to the community, to City Hall stakeholders. So I'm just curious, or I leave this thought with, um, with Heather Donison. I don't know, is this the appropriate time that citizens at large as well, Madam Deputy Mayor, are invited to this round table and to the beginning of this or is that for public forums down the road can Heather's or Chris through the city manager please that Heather reports to Madam Deputy Mayor through Chris uh, through you Madam Chair um, we would never exclude uh, anyone in this community from uh, participating uh, 
in these processes and uh, and certainly I think is um, Earth Day is a very convenient time to uh, to highlight the good work that's going on, not just by the city, but by all the, the formal groups that we work with, but also this will be uh, extend an opportunity to others that have passions about the environment to uh, uh, learn what's going on and to provide uh, their input and ideas uh, as part of that process as well. I'm, I'm satisfied with that. Thanks, Madam Deputy Mayor. Should I wait to see if there's others that want to comment on that? Anyone one? on this? Councillor Partridge, yes. I've learned my lesson. Thanks, so, Madam <laughs> Deputy Mayor. It's an extensive list today. Councillor Partridge on this item? Yes, thank you, Madam Deputy Mayor. I think uh, Madam Clerk's made note of Councillor Jackson's comments there. Um, just on 5.5, in going through the list, and I think this is a great idea, um, so I, I applaud staff for, for moving forward on it. I just want to make sure that the Hamilton Chamber of Commerce, they have an environmental committee, which was uh, established when I was chair of governance and uh, government affairs there, and we incubated it, and it's, it's a very big committee, very well engaged with the uh, businesses throughout the city, so I just wanted to make sure that they would be included along with the general public. Thank you. Information being taken. Councillor Farr, you had a question on this comment? 5-4, okay, then I'm going to uh, no more comments on 5-5. Councillor Jackson, in your second item, then I'll go to Councillor Farr. Thank you so much, Madam Deputy Mayor. Item 5.16, illegal dumping, litter, and escaped waste. Uh, Superintendent Glenn Wide, through uh, municipal law enforcement, uh, doing a tr tremendous job, and Joe Examine, who keeps uh, me posted on a couple of the hot spots in Ward 6. I see here the part-time staff's in place. I believe I read the report. The cameras are in place. Vehicles are not. Is there somebody that possibly either, maybe Mr. McCabe, if he doesn't have the appropriate staff uh, today, could get back to me, or if he can today, why vehicles are not in place? Is there some difficulty, the type of vehicles? Madam Deputy Mayor, through you, please. Thank you. Go ahead. Madam Deputy Mayor, through you, sir. We have the vehicles. Uh, it just took a, a little uh, processing problems. We uh, quickly acquired them a couple of weeks ago, and we're now using them. Okay. And if I could, thank you, Glenn. And if I could also leave a thought, uh, Madam Deputy Mayor, with uh, Superintendent Wide. Um, I know with the uh, CCLC that Councillor Collins and I serve on with the citizens, the Clean City Liaise Committee and the, and the uh, program um, against uh, graffiti, uh, we were very successful with those tremendous posters that graffiti is a crime that appeared in the bus shelters and that. And I just thought, you know what, um, even though I noticed in the report we're doing an education campaign about Project Trash Talk, which is good. Uh, but I just wondered, once again, I'll leave this thought with Glenn, uh, possibly that kind of poster campaign, that illegal dumping is a crime, affects all of us type of thing, because I thought the graffiti one has uh, definitely created an impact in the community. I'll leave that with Superintendent White. Thanks, Madam Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Farr. Thank you, Madam Chair. Happy New Year. Um, 5-4-D, 3-4. Um, this is from the Casino uh, Gaming Subcommittee, Gaming Facility Subcommittee. And uh, this, with respect to the discussion with regards to casino conditions, it looks like uh, the Gaming Committee had a number of um, uh, bullets here, discussion points from this meeting, which would have been November 30th. And up the top, it uh, indicates that staff advised that in order to bring a report back to the subcommittee on the casino location, staff were looking to get direction for the terms and conditions as each location will have a different set of parameters. And then it goes on with the bullets. And um, it begins with uh, the committee wanting to see a delineation of the three different locations. Uh, Flamborough, anywhere within the city, and downtown being the three locations. Uh, subsequent to that, there's a number of interesting uh, points. A lot of it associated to things like HECFI and and uh, down below the opinions of the restaurant industry, I guess the uh, gaming subcommittee asked for uh, uh, staff to go out and seek uh, opinions from the uh, restaurant in industry. I don't see BIA. I'd like to amend and maybe include uh, BIAs as well, um, if that's possible. But I'd just like to ask through you to, I guess, Tim McCabe. Um, this was November 30th. Where are we on this? And reading this, am I understanding it correctly that you're going to answer all these um, questions that uh, ar had arisen from the discussion on November 30th and and speak to the answers as they are delineated between the three locations. Mr. McCabe? 
Madam Deputy Mayor, we're going to try to provide as much information as we can related to most of it. But there's some questions there that are beyond staff uh, uh, commenting on. Could you possibly identify what those questions may be through you, Madam Chair, to Tim? Well, we don't know what the HECFI reference is. So we're having trouble with that one. And some of the profit sharing. Um, so that may just be a condition of council with relate, relating to profit sharing. I mean, OLG has a formula. And depending on the size of the casino, that would relate to uh, to the municipal con contribution. So if there's anything more the council wants from a profit sharing point of view beyond the that would have to be uh, something council would include. So. so it's talked about, but it's not clearly defined how we would want to work the uh, profit sharing. On the HECFI references I'm seeing, we do not want to see entertainment taken away from HECFI um, and that we're to use those existing facilities. Another point is re reciprocal co-production shows with HECFI facilities tied to a casino operation. So no one then has had those discussions with the um, soon-to-be operator, I guess, and um, nor these alleged or supposed uh, interested parties in bringing a casino to Hamilton then at this point through you, Madam Chair? Not that I know, Ms. Madam Deputy Mayor. Um, and what about discussions finally on these November 30th notes a little later in the discussion items? We're going to talk about another gaming uh, subcommittee meeting uh, as it relates to a few motions. I think one from uh, one of the uh, committee members in Council Marula. But the third bullet, page 304, if a proponent wishes to build a casino in the downtown area, that the proposal be required to include a hotel and entertainment function uh, in additional to the casino with gaming tables. I think there's another point that says the hotel would have to be built. Uh, um, at the same time that you can't have that as a future phase. Um, so where are we on that discussion through you, Madam Chair, to Tim, I guess? So, Madam Deputy Mayor, so the Planning and Economic Development Department, we're reporting back to committee with respect to the planning manners, the zoning manners, official plan policies, um, built form, potential conditions uh, in the in different locations for a casino, as well as the economic uh, information that the committee had asked for. So in that report, we're going to attempt to uh, provide answers uh, and information as to these questions as much as we can. So it's all going to be one report. Through you, Madam. Deputy Mayor, I, I guess you were quoted in a recent uh, article, Tim, so back to you for this question. Well, we know uh, um, there is interest. I mean, there's alleged interest out there based on some of your comments in the past, which I respect. You haven't uh, shied away from uh, offering that, and that's important, I think. But based on some of the points we see here, some of the past discussions at gaming subcommittee meetings, where we're headed in the future with respect to, well, it's limited, but we know some things. What uh, sort of reaction are you getting from at least the one that we're all very aware of uh, to some of these points, working with restaurants, uh, how you build the thing, where you build the thing, through you, Madam Chair. You can just comment on that generally if it's possible at this point. Madam Deputy Mayor, we haven't had that type of detailed discussions. Thank you. And uh, Councillor Farr, your question with regards to adding into these minutes, Madam Clerk, these are minutes of a subcommittee. Can we amend them here? I don't think we can. It would have to be done at the subcommittee. I don't know whether you want to give just general direction to staff to include. I'll talk to one of the, to one of the members and maybe they Thank can bring you. it so forward. We'll, we'll take that off the table. Thank That's you. That's regarding uh, getting the, the BIA's BIA input. Well, correct. Thank you. Councillor Clark. Yes, so I'm just trying to clear up in my mind how we're going to mosey down the road here. Are we as a GIC committee expected now, reading this document, to provide the direction on the terms and conditions on each location? Or are we continuing to do what we were doing, is providing plausible uh, conditions that staff would review and then come back and make a recommendation as to whether or not those terms or conditions are appropriate to attach to a casino. 
My question clear? Mr. Mayor, you wish to speak to that? Yes, as Thank the you. chair of the subcommittee, the, uh, through you to the councillor, what we have done is made potential propon proponents aware of the thinking around this table. And now we're awaiting the response. And so apparently we will get a response, uh, according to uh, uh, Tim, with regard to uh, the Mercantes and others. And there may be no response from anybody else because they may have reviewed our information, which is out there, said, well, we, you know, it doesn't look like we really want to be in this scenario. I have no idea, but the fact is we put out what we feel uh, are suggested conditions, and that's not to say, Madam Deputy Mayor, that a proponent might say, well, we're willing to do this, but we need 24 hours or we need ATM. It would, you know, so now we get into the discussion. But we went through the process of saying, what are the things that we feel are important? Here they are, and now we await the response, and that's where we are with that. Thank you. Okay, so I guess what I was trying to get clear is the documentation that's going to be coming back from Mr. McCabe and his group will be the terms or conditions, use either language, that perhaps is acceptable to the proponents, but in the eyes of our staff is most appropriate for the casino proposal. So it's not something that we're just going to be throwing out wording at the last minute. Because the clauses that I provided you were the brainstorming more than anything else that we're in a finalized term or condition. I want to make sure that we're getting the finalized documents. So I'm looking for someone to either nod or... So, Madam Deputy Mayor, I don't think together we've worked out this process. So we are going to bring you potential conditions we would like to see from a planning and economic development point of view. You've told us this brainstorming set of conditions, and we all know it's a political decision. So I think uh, we're gearing up on February 14th. I think there's a notice that's going to be coming out to clerks to have a GIC devoted exclusively to this casino issue that the committee in council is going to decide what conditions the, that uh, you would like to attach to it. Not sure we're going to have a situation or an opportunity um, to go to casino operators to see if this is suitable to them. Not sure how we could even work that. Um. Well, I thought I heard the mayor say that, that those conversations have happened, so maybe his office has shared this information with the proponents. I, I don't know, but it would be appropriate that they at least know what we're talking about. So, Madam Deputy Mayor, there are, they are aware, Councilor Clark, of these brainstorming conditions, the people that are in tune with what's happening. Okay, let me ask very clear. Has anyone talked to the proponents specifically about the conditions that have been suggested by this body? Spoken to. Picked up the phone and said, hello, Sam. So, yes. Thank you. That it, Councillor Clark? Thank you. Councillor Ferguson? Yes, the, 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 we seem to have drifted away a bit from approving the minutes, but I, I just want to, you know, we've got into a good conversation, but the minutes of November 30th does point out 18 different, uh, I think they're called discussion items that the committee's asked for more information on. Something that I've asked both publicly and privately, never got the answer to yet, and it worries me that we're going out to two public meetings this week, we're doing telephone polls without having this question answered yet, is what's the economic benefit to the city? We currently get $4.5 million from Flamborough, that's over half a percent on our tax rate. When the heck are we going to have that answer so we can, so the public, when they give us feedback, can have, be fully informed? Uh, what's the big secret? Through if I can to Mr. McCabe. Madam Deputy Mayor, we're hoping to have some information that at least OLG can approximately confirm as part of our February 14th uh, report to you. Um, so it all depends on the size of the casino and everything else that's related to the formula. So um, we know and we've told everyone that it is 
completely unreasonable for this council to even decide or make a decision on a casino without that financial information as part of that decision making. Okay, but I'm, I'm really puzzled by that. In other parts of the province, have, have the municipality, host municipalities been told what to expect in revenue? So I'm only aware of Toronto and they've hired Ernst & Young and Ernst & Young has put out that figure um, in terms of the 80 to 100 million dollars. Hasn't Kingston also? Or the islands, the Wolf Island? I don't know. Through you to Norm. Do you know, Norm, if, uh, if there's another municipality that's been told how much revenue to expect? Three, <clears throat> three Madam Chair. Other municipalities have started doing some economic impact analysis, but it is very much at a generic standpoint because they do not know exactly where the size of this uh, facility is going to be. The only thing we know in concrete terms is what the municipal contribution agreement formula is at this point in time. Um, I mean, we can speculate as to the size of a, a hotel or the size of a development that might go along with that, but we don't even have a definitive uh, size. Um, I mean, they've told us 1,200 slots uh, uh, potentially for Hamilton, but uh, they have not indicated the number of tables that could be here. So it, it, a lot of it is also dependent on uh, the Toronto uh, decision and the location of where the casino goes in Toronto is the size of our facility that we're going to have here as well. Because I expect, Madam Chairman, if the amount is zero, that'll impact us significantly. And if it's $50 million, that will impact us significantly. And so, uh, you know, the price is right. I need to know the number. And, and Norm, to the economic, you, call, you quoted an, a municipal contribution uh, formula. Using that formula, guessing the number of tables, just so it gets some kind of number, what's that generate for the city of Hamilton? Uh, through you, Madam Chairman, uh, the tables will not generate any revenue at this point in time. Uh, the only revenue that comes through to the uh, municipality is through the slots. So t table gaming revenue, we do not get a cut of the table gaming revenue. Is that, it, just on that then, to you, Madam Chairman, does Brantford get a, a portion of the gaming tables in, in, uh, in Niagara? No, they do not. Okay. So, so based on the slots, what's the revenue? I believe um, maybe Mr. Zaire can uh, jump in here, but under the new formula, and we, do, we have signed a new municipal contribution agreement moving forward um, as of April, uh, I believe March 31st, April 1st this year. Uh, I think it works out to about 4.7 million, so we're up about 300,000 from, from last year. Okay, so that's with the increase in the number of slots. So you to Mr. Zagaric then. Based on the slots that have been identified by OL and Terra Lauder and Gaming Corporation for Hamilton, we're looking at an increase of two to three hundred thousand dollars then. Through the chair, uh, based on correspondence from OLG, we've estimated, according to Norm, that uh, the solid revenues for 2013 would be 4.7 million or three hundred thousand dollars over and above 2012's budget at 4.4 for Flamborough. Okay. For 2013. And, and, and that's total revenue since the gaming tables will give us nothing. So, so this the the. Through the chair, the estimate of the $4.7 million reflects 2013 forecast revenues for the existing facility. Okay, but I want to know if we, if, if we go to an expanded facility like OGLG is looking for, how many additional slots would that mean? And what's that mean in new revenue? I want to know a number. I'm looking for a number that the public can hear at the public meetings this week. Madam Chairman. Based on a uh, presentation from uh, Rod Phillips when he was here back in November, he indicated that uh, by moving it to a, a more central location, we could probably see a 5 to 10 percent increase on our slot revenue at a minimum. The answer then is 5 to 5.5 .5 million dollars then, if it's 10 percent. Correct. Thank you. Okay, hey, committee members, I just, with indulgence, I do have a speaker's list continuing on. I'm assuming it's on this item. I have Councillor McCaddy, Councillor Marula, Councillor Clark, Councillor Whitehead. Remembering these are minutes, and Madam Clerk, you just clarified, these have already been approved at Council in December. So I just, I understand for the interest of debate and information, it's great, but these have already been approved. So I'm not sure, is this correct, Madam Clerk, this has already been approved? Okay, so is there a question with regards to the minutes themselves that they've already been approved, Councillor McCaddy? Uh, and Madam I don't Chair, mean to stymie the conversation, but it's just kind of awkward because they are minutes and they're not in. I'm sure I had a question on the, on the minutes, but I wonder if I could just clarify with Carolyn. I, 
why are the minutes here if they've already been approved at council? That seems a bit different than what we usually do. Councilor McCarty, through the chair, the minutes of all the various uh, subcommittees and advisory committees are uh, forwarded to the appropriate standing committees to be received for information only. If there are recommendations from those subcommittees that require a standing committee approval, they are formally submitted as a report to the standing committee and formally approved and forwarded on to council. But it is the practice of, of um, the minutes of advisory committees and, and subcommittees to come before the appropriate standing committee just for information purposes to be received. Thank you. So these have already been through to council. I'm still confused, Madam Chair. And I, and I only the reason I uh, extend this uh, conversation is because I'm going to ask a question on the minutes, and I don't even know if that's appropriate. This whole discussion, uh, if if it's already been to council. Madam Clerk, can I just get clarification? Because further on, we have 8.5. Is that not the report that we'll be dealing with this more in in depth? Yes. The the minutes of the subcommittees come to the standing committee for information once they have been ratified by the subcommittee. So this meeting was November 30th of the Gaming Facility Proposal Subcommittee. Those minutes went to the Gaming Facility Proposal Subcommittee at their meeting on December 5th to be formally approved. And then once they are approved by the subcommittee, they are submitted to GIC for information purposes to be received. Okay, so it sounds like it's appropriate for us to ask questions about the minutes uh, today. Um, I'm sure if I understand correctly. So just the November 30th uh, minutes on page three or four, uh, there's a item two there, discussion respecting casino conditions. And I just had a, a question. Of, uh, I wasn't able to attend the, uh, the meeting, the subcommittee meeting, not being on the committee, the subcommittee that is. Item uh, bullet number three says, if a proponent wishes to build a casino in the downtown, proposal be required to include a hotel and entertainment function. And I, I'm just, in my research on uh, casinos and other uh, municipalities, it appears one of the key challenges in a downtown scenario is that the uh, casino uh, attracts a number of folks, as, as you would expect, but in fact they don't leave the casino, they, they stay there, they eat there, they drink there, and they don't uh, use uh, other restaurants in the downtown, in, the, in, the, in this case uh, in the downtown Hamilton area. So I wonder if I could just ask for a clarification from uh, a committee member. Uh, what was the thinking behind including a casino in, in a hotel, in a, it looks like a new hotel is the suggestion here, uh, which has uh, eating facilities, drinking facilities, and that sort of thing. And what was the analysis done on how that would affect the uh, existing uh, downtown businesses, the existing downtown restaurants through you, Madam Chair, to a committee member, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You said you wish you can answer yeah, that. As the chair, I can speak to that. Um, the the idea, uh, Councillor, is that a standalone Brantford-style casino dropped into the downtown would be one thing that probably wouldn't be acceptable broadly in the community. But a facility that had only a portion, 25% of the activity of the development, uh, was the casino portion. If you have uh, a hotel with other amenities within the hotel that aren't necessarily directly related to the casino, if you have an entertainment venue, Madam Deputy Mayor, which, and I believe it was Councillor Marula who suggested that if such a facility were built, that it would not, you would not have to channel through the gaming tables in the casino to get to the facility, that it would be articulated with the street. And so if, uh, Barry Manilow was coming to that uh, facility, you would come through the street entrance and buy your ticket and go and sit down. It would not necessarily be a function. So the, uh, the, the argument would be that the uh, uh, appended facilities would not be a, a requirement to go through the casino to get to them, so they would be extra amenities to the city beyond the simple gaming portion. Thanks, uh, Madam Chair. And, and the particular concern that I have become aware through the research that I've done that it would negatively affect uh, uh, other restaurants in the downtown, how was that? Uh, has that been covered yet? I don't see it as a, as a, a specific uh, condition. 
also I would think that this one could be problematic from that perspective uh, through you to uh, the chair of the committee, Mr. Mayor. Uh, well, all I can say to that, Madam Deputy Mayor, is that, and I spoke to this before, I, I know almost every one of the prominent restaurateurs in the downtown, all of them have insisted that we should have a casino. And I have made the same argument to them. If I've ever been to a casino, I see the smorgasbord and you know the restaurant and all that, and people aren't going to go and leave the casino and start looking for restaurants. And they, they don't seem to care. They want the activity and the flow of people that's associated, one would associate with a casino. So that's their comment. It's not my comment. That's their comment. Restaurateurs, generally speaking, we may get a report from the downtown BIA because they have been surveying the, uh, all of the businesses. So that will be very helpful in terms of that uh, comment. Mm -hmm. We'll certainly look forward to that report from the BIA. Intuitively, it's, it seems problematic, but uh, if the restaurants are in favor uh, through your conversations, Mr. Mayor, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. I have Councillor Marula, then Councillor Clark, then Councillor Whitehead. Uh, just in an attempt to um, try to expedite uh, this particular issue, a lot of the concerns that are being uh, presented, Madam uh, Deputy Chair or Mayor, is outlined in the minutes themselves. So um, there was a motion that I brought forward which was somewhat encompassing of all, everything that is being con being brought forward as a concern today. And it would probably be in our best interest perhaps to allow that report to come forward before we ask any further questions uh, so that we can get along with this, uh, or go along with this uh, agenda. You're Thank absolutely you. correct, Councillor. Thank you very much. Councillor Clark. Um, I have one question on where we are now, and I'll reserve the other question until 8.5. I thought I heard Norman say the municipal partnership agreement has been signed. Did I hear that? Yes, I believe it went through audit, finance, and administration. Um, and that includes what the fees are going to be for this? Okay, this, this is what, uh, through, through Madam Chairman, this is for, as of March 31st, uh, the, the lease expires, so there has to be a new agreement put uh, in place up at Flamborough Downs. Flamborough Downs will continue to operate, whether or not there's a new operator, or, or uh, Great Canadian Gaming will continue to operate at Flamborough Downs moving forward. So there's been a new municipal contribution agreement put into place that will take us from that point moving forward on the slots. So, okay, and what's that amount of money? for Flamborough Down, Downs to continue past their current expected termination date. What, what is that amount of money? Yes. Okay, so, so basically based on uh, our former agreement, it was $4.4 .4 million. We were uh, allocated, I believe it was in 2012, Mike, and uh, they're, they're, they're speculating that, uh, or calculating if uh, revenues stay the way they are from the slots, it will rise to $4.7 million. So it's a, this new financial contribution agreement is actually of a net benefit to the city under the current slots operating at Flamborough Downs. This isn't new slots coming in anywhere else in the city. This is just for the 800 slot machines that are currently in operation at Flamborough Downs. Okay, so to be clear, um, Madam Deputy Mayor, I heard a couple of figures. Is it 4.1 currently, that's what's being maintained, or has the new um, municipal partnership agreement that has been signed risen, or taken that to 4.7? Perhaps I'll let Mr. Zagarek clarify that point. Thank you. For, for you, Madam Chair, the correspondence we received from OLG and based on their historical gaming activity levels and their uh, proposed funding formula would take the forecasted Flamborough slot revenues in 2013 to $4.7 million from $4.4 million that was budgeted for in 2012. And how long is the reprieve on the extension of the lease? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, I would have to uh, go back to the December minutes to, to uh, review you the terms. perhaps get that before we discuss 8.5 today, please? Thank through you, you, Madam Chair. I'll get that information. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Councillor Whitehead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, the number of uh, questions were asked on the minutes, and I certainly understand and appreciate uh, uh, Councillor uh, Marilla's suggestion on 8.5, but doesn't address a lot of the issues that are being addressed in the minutes. Uh, so we are uh, open to ask questions on the minutes. And I guess just for clarification, I know I, I, I moved the idea that maybe there can be a synergy between uh, a downtown casino with 
excluding an entertainment component other than maybe a museum or whatever, but uh, and, and see if there could be a partnership with our HECFI facility so that there could be co-sponsored and co-produced shows to bring people downtown. And obviously when you bring people downtown, the casino is available, it might be uh, an attraction uh, for them as a suggestion. But this is, uh, I think Councillor Clark hit this on the, on the head. It's, it's about sort of creating uh, uh, a number of IDs for consideration on the conditions. But at the end of the day, we still got consultation taking place. We still have perhaps our proponent that's coming before, and we need to hear uh, clearly uh, what impediments some of these conditions may cause or, or how they could be uh, addressed differently before we adopt anything. So I would hope that uh, as we move down this process to make informed decisions, that we don't lock positions in uh, today. What we do is receive, listen, conclude the process, and then make hopefully informed decision. So I do appreciate Councillor Clark's comments earlier. Thank you. Now that everyone's had the opportunity to make their comments on this, may I have a motion to approve items 5-1 to 5-17? Moved by Councillor Collins, second by Councillor Johnson, all in favour? And then items 5-19 to 5-21, inclusive. Moved by Councillor Clark, second by Councillor Partridge, all in favour? Carried. Thank you, everyone. Okay, moving on, we have members of committee, as you know, uh, our, we previously advised the public delegation will be rescheduled to a future meeting for item 6.1, that's Ryan Moran, so we don't have to do anything there, correct, Madam Clerk? We've already approved that future delegation, thank you. We're going to move on to item 7, presentations, members of committee, I'd like now to call on Paul Johnson to introduce item 7.1 and the neighborhood representatives who will be speaking to the neighborhood action plans for Davis Creek and Riverdale neighborhoods. Good morning, Paul. Good morning. Good morning, Madam uh, Deputy Mayor. It is uh, my pleasure to be here this morning to continue to bring forward information and updates around the work in a number of our neighborhoods here in this city. This morning you will be hearing from two neighborhoods who are bringing forward their neighborhood action plans. This is a follow-up from uh, the meeting that was held, the special meeting of General Issues Committee in late September, where you heard from four neighborhoods on their planning processes. I would like to just remind you that uh, as well as the plans that are coming forward today, the first four plans that were approved and endorsed by yourselves, uh, we have begun that implementation process and are pleased with some of the things that are happening. We're pleased to hear that uh, there will be renovations happening at the Eva Rothwell Resource Center in Keith neighborhood, and we will be a partner in the investment that will go on there, making that a more vital community center for that community. We're, we're, we're pleased to hear that over $450,000 of investments from the Hamilton Community Foundation will be flowing through 41 grants into eight of the neighborhoods that we're involved with in partnership with the foundation here at the city. We're pleased that a number of resident leaders are participating in a leadership program called the Neighborhood Leadership Institute and are uh, building their capacity to be leaders within their own communities. And we're also pleased to see reports that have come forward to you around community economic development and investment in our parks that will be assisting some of these neighborhoods as well. In short, implementation is underway as well as the planning that you're going to hear about today. So you'll hear from two communities today, both, both in Ward 5 uh, Davis Creek, which is in the Quigley Road area, and this group of residents is so uh, excited about the work that's going on in the neighborhood that uh, they've even proposed that they call themselves by a different name. So uh, changing names and bringing some spirit uh, to the community is what this process is all about. You'll also hear from the Riverdale community in the east end of our community as well. I'm going to ask both to come forward and suggest to you, Madam Deputy Mayor, that we hear from both communities first and then entertain questions to those resident leaders. As always, I want to thank the staff, in particular Suzanne Brown, who's been leading our community engagement process around the development of these plans, and in particular the Social Planning and Research Council, who assisted in facilitating these conversations in the Riverdale neighborhood. But as always, it's the residents who own these plans and will be at the center of them. And so it's the residents who will be presenting these plans to you today. Following the presentations and any questions that you have of them, there are recommendations in our report. These recommendations are almost identical. Some names and report titles have changed, but uh, they're almost identical to the recommendations that came forward to you on September 24th when we dealt with the first four neighborhood plans. 
So without further ado, I'd like to call upon David DeLandis from the Davis Creek community. He's here with his daughter, I think, who's uh, also part of the uh, public gallery this morning. Uh, David, welcome. Good morning, David. Thank you. Yes, and welcome. Good morning. Thank you. Um, I guess, first of all, I'd just like to say that... Um, Open it down a bit. We okay? Okay. Um, I am the uh, co-chair of uh, the Davis Creek uh, uh, Community Planning Team, um, and uh, unfortunately, uh, of error of mine, uh, I did have a short uh, uh, video I had put together of the neighborhood. Um, to my understanding, uh, it is going to be available on the minutes through the website. So um, I would appreciate if everyone took a look at it uh, when you have time. Um, mostly uh, the point of the video was just to kind of highlight some of the diversity of, of the uh, Davis Creek area. It is like from one end to the other as far as uh, you know the financial side of things. Um, you have million dollar homes on one side and, and right in that core area, um, you know, there's there's a few properties that, that most people would consider somewhat of an eyesore or somewhat on the lower end of things. Um, and I actually happen to live on one of them. Um, I think um, uh, from from uh, my experience anyway, uh, I didn't always live in that area and, and I came down there some three years ago um, and moving into the area, um, I noticed there's a big difference between my daughter and some of the other kids there in terms of, you know, I guess the aggression and the, the language and things like that. And uh, that's kind of how I got involved initially was um, getting involved on the property I'm in. And I started a uh, tenant association there and tried to do some stuff there and, and slowly it migrated on to uh, being part of the Davis Creek uh, group as well. And uh, I guess what I'd like to say is uh, in regards to the Davis Creek uh, group, it, it sounds like a, a newer group uh, compared to some of the other neighborhoods maybe. But I think the fact of the matter is that neighborhood is still just as old a neighborhood and the people involved on the group have been involved um, in pockets as is already and it's just a matter that things are starting to come together and uh, uh, if you go around to some of the properties even the ones like I say that are on the lower end um, you'll find that they do have maybe a summer barbecue going on where they do still try to have a community type spirit on that property and there's more than than one so that some of that was highlighted in that video um, where I was able to get some still shots from different uh, different activities going on um, so, uh, as of right now, I mean, uh, as a group, we've only been together for about a year, just coming up on anyway. Um, we've already, um, you know, formulated this plan based on what we see immediately as being our five goals. Um, and uh, we, uh, so far, as far as, um, I guess, accomplishments-wise, um, we can say that we have been um, continuing with promoting the events that we see already going on, as well as trying to come up with new ones that we want to engage everyone in and uh, see if that will spin into an outreach type thing where we can start pulling them into the greater, you know, sitting around the table trying to figure out together how we're going to pull the whole area into something. Um, and as far as the accomplishments already in this year, um, as we were able to cite that the street uh, Albright, Albright Road, uh, they have three elementary schools all in that same area. So we have you know, a high density of kids in that area. And for some reason, that, uh, that street uh, slipped under the radar as far as being uh, posted appropriately as a school zone and such. Um, so that was something that we were able to um, work on and, and get changed uh, immediately. Um, I guess uh, one of our bigger uh, concerns, obviously, at this point would be the, uh, the whole redevelopment of Bishop Ryan. Um, that whole area because uh, the fact of the matter is as far as Laurier Rec Center, they share that gym and um, the uh, um, once, once Bishop Ryan is gone obviously there's going to be an issue, there's going to be a loss of the gym and I think the area is already like just to stay at level, um, you know we really need to see what's going to happen as far as trying to uh, uh, have a, a new gym put in place somehow connected to uh, um, the, the rec center. 
That rec center happens to be probably one of our top assets in that area, and especially that is geographically located amongst those, you know, lesser properties, if you wish. Um, so as we as we work and hopefully get uh, move that direction, um, we'd like to see that uh, um, we can, I guess, try and push some programming or try and um, highlight things that are needed in the community that are specific to that area. Try and utilize uh, that space as uh, something of a meeting area for the youth um, and for other programming that might be required. Um, I would like to say that, uh, like I said uh, earlier, that we do have a number of people in the core group of our Davis Creek planning team and they've uh, been active in the community for a long time. So although the name is new, um, like I say, there's a lot of uh, um, experience already there as far as uh, the dedication, as far as already trying to get out, trying to talk to people, trying to get uh, interest and, and get feedback about what we're going to do, how we're going to do things. Um, and we're certainly looking forward to being able to bring back information and be kept up to date as, as uh, accurately as possible um, so that we can move that quickly, quicker as, you know, as can be. Obviously, we don't have any uh, firm idea about, about where that's at. Um, we can hear all kinds of things, uh, but we don't know specifically. Um, but I do think that uh, uh, you know, moving in an expeditious fashion as far as getting that, that new gym put in, uh, if that can be uh, arranged, because I, I do think that's going to be a critical point to uh, maintaining, you know, maybe the sanity level, if you wish, of, of the youth in the area. Um, I guess, um, I don't know. I, I'm kind of a little bit of lost because my, my little four-minute video is uh, non-existent right at this moment. So if there's any questions, I guess. Thank you, David. Okay. Councillor Collins, did you wish to? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, David. As you can hear, Madam Deputy Mayor, there are uh, some residents from both of the neighbourhoods who are presenting to you today uh, with us uh, in the public gallery. I'd also be remiss if I uh, didn't uh, mention and, and bring specific attention to uh, Judy Klusterman, who is the community development worker for both of these neighbourhoods, no stranger around uh, this table and in this community. From a presentation perspective for Riverdale uh, neighborhood, I'd like to uh, invite forward Roxana Amir to uh, come and present to us today. Her family also in the, uh, in the gallery with us, but uh, come forward. Hello and good morning everyone and happy new year. Okay. Hello and uh, good morning and uh, happy new year. Everyone, my name is Ruksana Amir and uh, I am from Pakistan. And this is my first time speaking like this to a group like you. English is not my first language. And uh, please be kind with me because maybe I mistake, <laughs> do some mistake and I'm sorry about that. And uh, I came to Canada uh, almost uh, 13 years ago. I have lived in Riverdale uh, almost five years. Riverdale is a community of uh, many people from different countries around the world and, uh, and is very multicultural. We have so much to learn from everyone. It's a great place to live. Riverdale has the highest population of the renters in the city, highest population of the poverty in the city, and has the highest population of the new Canadians. There are 17 high-rise apartment buildings, five townhouse complexes and single houses. There are over 7,500 people who live in Riverdale. Riverdale is like from Lake Avenue, Centennial Parkway, Queenston Road, and Barton. Every September, we have our Fall Fest, which brings together all the communities. Riverdale has been doing the Fall Fest for about 15 years. 
two of the most important place in Riverdale for me, have a community center and the ESL school. I met most of friends there. I have learned a lot of things there too. Before that, I was in my apartment building not knowing anyone. I joined the Women Alive program. I met a lot of women there and I make a friends over there. I became active in Riverdale community about five years ago. I joined the Neighborhood Hub community in 2006. This group became the Riverdale planning team in 2012. I am proud to be a chair of that committee. Our first step was the bringing the community together to see what they needed, what we were missing. We have a very good group of community residents, very nice people. There are about 28 on our list to call for meetings. The committee members are from all different backgrounds. We want people to move in Riverdale, stay in the Riverdale, and raise their families in the Riverdale. We worked all about, although the 2012 to do the plan work, we are very proud of this plan. We hope as a community we have brought the voice of the people forward and have covered their main concerns. Issues the planning team is working on, first one is space. The team doesn't have regular meeting space. The community center is full of Saturday programs. It's a hard to meet in the apartment because tenants are scared of their superintendents. We were working with the school to see if they have space. Hopefully we will find space we can our own. Second one is the improve the quality of tenants housing in Riverdale. Third one, to increase food security for residents in Riverdale. That's just to name a few, the whole plan in the in is your Riverdale Neighborhood Action Plan book. Just like I said earlier, we want that people in Riverdale do not do it, and in Riverdale live and raise their families there. And I want to thank you for your support कि आप लोगों ने मुझे यहाँ मधु किया कि मैं रिवेडल के बारे में बात करूं। As I said before, we want people to move in the Riverdale, stay in the Riverdale, and the raise their families in the Riverdale. I would like to thank for you invite me to speak to you today about Riverdale, and I wanna thank you Jody because she helped me a lot. That's my first time, and she make me like she give me confidence. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Excellent presentation. Yeah, come on. At this forward. time, Madam Deputy Mayor, uh, our speakers are available for questions, and uh, either myself or Suzanne, if uh, there are questions on the staff recommendations, are available to answer those. Thank you, and I'll start my speakers list. And I have Councillor Collins and Councillor Johnson. Madam Chairman, I, I don't have any questions at this point in time. Um, if you want to put me on the speakers list, then, then I'd like to speak at that point. Questions, then, Councillor Johnson? No? Speakers list. So no one has any questions? Thank you. Mr. Mayor? Through you, Deputy Mayor, to uh, both presenters. How do you communicate with the broader group? We have these very committed people who are around us, and everyone is interested. But uh, do you use community newspapers, uh, uh, email, cascades? Could you tell me, both of you, how you approach the communication part? Uh, well, initially, uh, we did start with just flyering, um, and uh, uh, Maria is uh, tenacious with that. Uh, she's, she's out there flyering like uh, you don't know. But uh, we did uh, sit down. We do have uh, an email. We, we did start a Facebook page as well. Um, we, we did talk to Councillor new, uh, about his newsletter and putting something in there, as well as uh, um, we've gone to uh, the parent council over at Wilford Laurier now. Uh, we'll be on our second time. Um, and they've uh, added us into their newsletter there as well. 
Um, so we are trying to um, hit as much as possible. Um, as well as the meetings themselves, we do rotate them. Um, and we have them on a, so many months kind of thing in one area and one area, one area within Davis Creek. So we are trying to uh, and change the time, the date uh, kind of thing. So try and make it as accessible as possible. Have you uh, considered a newsletter, a formal uh, of our own? published newsletter? Oh, I, I think we did discuss it at some point, but I think at this point we were more thinking if we can uh, piggyback onto other ones uh, at this early stage anyway. Right, thanks. And how about uh, Davis Creek Communications? Just Riverdale. I'm sorry, Riverdale. <laughs> yeah, and um, then we invite them, we call them, and we email them. And uh, we have a translational, translator like um, in the community, like Arabic, Urdu, Hindi, like uh, whatever they need. We have a translation. Okay, it's just my concern, Madam Deputy Mayor, is that we don't lose any momentum. That the great work starts and the people collect together, and then people get busy and they assume that you're all working on their behalf. But you really have to keep the whole community engaged to the greatest extent possible. And we know how hard it is to get messaging out these days. So thanks for those comments. And I think that uh, should there be any um, need for uh, help with things like newsletters, uh, even financial considerations, I'm sure that council and and the various councillors would, would care to uh, want to assist in any way we could. Those are my comments and questions. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Thank you. Now I'll go to comments then, Councillor Collins. Uh, I first want to apologize to the group for the wait that, um, that you had prior to presenting here today. Um, second, I, I wanted to uh, thank uh, both of the groups for their presentations. Both David and Roxana did a, a tremendous job today of presenting. And, and I think if there's two messages, um, if I can you know, highlight two issues that affect both groups. Uh, first and foremost, as you probably read in the report, for the Riverdale area, their top issue there is property standards. And uh, their group is very supportive of the proactive uh, enforcement program that we have through Glenn White and Marty Hazel's group. And so as we continue to debate um, the licensing of landlords and our proactive property standards program, I want you to think of Riverdale as the poster child for, um, for that program and a neighborhood where that program has been tremendously successful. So we've made our way into some of the buildings in that area. Um, hopefully we eventually get into all of those buildings. And um, as you'll note from the report, that has been an issue for them for a number of years. And so the program that we've established over the last number of years, which is now currently a pilot program, is one that will continue to help them if it's made, uh, if we in fact make that a permanent program. For Davis Creek, um, as David mentioned during his presentation, uh, again, there are a number of goals and objectives in their presentation. But for them, I think top of the list right now is to certainly retain as much of the uh, recreational resources as, as that they currently have. And this council was kind enough, Madam Chairman, as you know, over the last uh, several weeks to make an offer to purchase three acres of the Bishop Ryan site to accommodate the request that David and his group has asked for. And that is, at the, at the very least, the retention and hopefully a small expansion to the Sir Wilfrid Loyer Recreation Center that services uh, those people who are in the Davis Creek catchment area. And so I know that there are a lot of, um, again, there are a lot of goals and objectives in the reports that have come from us from the neighborhood planning teams. For me, those are the two biggest issues right now for those respective communities. And, and it's obviously not just uh, David and Roxana who are um, here today asking for that. They have a great support group, and they're actually my support group. Um, uh, Evelyn, um, Marie, Yudranka, uh, Wanda, there are so many people who um, have helped to get us to where we are today. And, and like all of us around the table, um, our job is made a whole lot easier from people uh, like these individuals who help us with the day-to-day -day grassroots things in our neighborhoods. And so I, at this point in time, wanted to publicly thank all of them who are here today and those who couldn't be here today um, because they, they certainly make our community, our neighborhoods, our city a better place with the volunteer um, hours that they donate, some of them into the dozens or hundreds of hours a year uh, dedicated for the sole purpose of just making their neighborhood or the place that they live in um, a better place. And so I, again, lastly, I want to thank Judy, who everyone knows. And uh, Judy has been in this business for about 20 years in different capacities. And um, I can honestly say that um, she is a very special person. And she has done so many things, not just for the neighborhoods that are here today, but for Ward 5, for the East End, and by extension for our city. And I, 
I, I think, um, you know, there aren't too many people like Judy around who spends her whole life trying to solve everyone else's problems. And uh, I, I, too, want to do publicly thank Judy for all that she's done over the years and what she continues to do on a day-to-day -day basis for everyone who lives in the city of Hamilton. Thanks, Madam Chairman. Well said. Thank you, Councillor. Well said. Councillor Johnson? I don't know how I can top that, to be honest with you, but I wanted to also make comments about uh, both these areas. Um, I saw, well, as soon as you open up the booklet, you see the Hamilton Community Foundation's logo, and Sharon Charters uh, walked in in the middle of the uh, presentation, Sharon, and anybody who would know Sharon's history knows that I believe 20 years ago you started up with the Riverdale group as well. So congratulations to Sharon. You look like the proud mom up there. Um, and David Derbyshire's here, Debbie Clinton's here, and, and Judy. These are people that have been working in these neighborhoods long before we said we needed work in those neighborhoods. These people had a vision and it's so nice to see this come to be. Thank you to both of you for coming today. You both admitted that you don't do this on a regular basis. Well, you did amazingly well. And you spoke well on behalf of your, your neighborhoods. So here, here to everyone. Thank you very much, Deputy Mayor. Again, well said. Thank you. Councillor Farr. Yeah, just quickly want to thank David and Rosanna and, uh, and uh, just um, uh, having a look at these in advance. Uh, it's great to see the visions and well, well crafted. Obviously, it took some time as a group uh, uh, putting together the missions and the values and, and your visions. And, uh, you know, when I looked at that and, and then took a look at some of the previous neighborhood development work, same sort of uh, binding and, and presentations that, of course, we had in a very memorable uh, council meeting that's uh, devoted itself specifically to uh, neighborhood development. Um, uh, we, we see similar things. And then when you start to get into these documents, you start get a clearer, uh, uh, to get a clearer understanding, Madam Chairman, of um, uh, some different needs in different communities throughout the city. So I, I would uh, highly recommend that folks that want to better understand our city as it relates to neighborhood by neighborhood by neighborhood to have a look at these uh, documents because you're hearing it straight from uh, the residents and um, it's most valuable I believe and uh, very well presented here today and congratulations on all of the work that uh, you've done in your community. I, I suspect and from what I've seen now over a year in places like Beasley and, and Stinson community and to the mayor's comment uh, I, I think um, People are, are that, that maybe had not been engaged before, that got engaged, that did start uh, attending meetings, um, if they f uh, feel um, that that time wasn't wasted and that, that the goals and missions and these actions that you've carefully listed out and prioritized here um, are, are acted upon and come to fruition, as we heard from the ward councillor, uh, in, in many cases, or in some cases it has, and that continues, that engagement level will only increase. And uh, folks will remain um, entrenched in, in the neighborhood development piece as it relates to, uh, you know, um, um, a, a ground, on the ground commitment from the people who are, are obviously um, uh, most affected by uh, what goes on in their surroundings, and that, that would be the residents. So, uh, well done. It's a great program. I'm, I'm, I'm very much a proponent of neighborhood development. I've seen it in action. I've seen it work here in the downtown core as the Ward 2 Councillor, and I've seen the commitment from the residents and their satisfaction in many cases as we're moving forward. And a little later, you're going to even see some approval items uh, with respect to a discussion item where it's laid out and uh, where some discretionary funding on my part is used actually to the tune of over $700,000 specifically to address the action items in two, two different neighborhoods with respect to this piece. And hopefully it sees council's approval a little later and I'll speak to it a little bit later. But I'm so committed and so, uh, so uh, very much enthralled in the uh, mandate of this as it, as it uh, goes forward that uh, I, wanna, I want to answer to the folks and an answer to that commitment in the in the ter in terms of uh, supporting it uh, financially moving forward, and uh, we'll see that a little bit later. And with that, uh, again, Madam Chair, I'll have to conclude with saying what I've already said publicly many times. Congratulations to Paul Johnson and his staff and neighborhood development. They're doing great work in, in getting people organized, getting people together. And then of course the people themselves from these various neighborhoods are, are taking that ball and running with it. And it's most impressive and I think it's it's a game changer for our city. Thank you.
Thank you, Councillor. Again, well said, and I, I just put, like to put forward a few comments also. Thank you. I know how hard it is and uh, to stand up here and to bring forward your, your group's uh, sort of discussions and comments and trying to make it all filter through and what you remember as you're standing at that podium. It's not easy. You did an excellent job. And uh, I know in the presentations received in the fall from the other groups that we had earlier, um, all I can say is I think it's wonderful. It's your neighborhood and uh, you can encapsulate and grasp all of your needs and work together. It may be inch by inch, but you're getting your neighborhoods back. And I think that's the most wonderful thing that I see here every time I hear these presentations uh, is just that, that respect and understanding that you all are creating going forward. And uh, you know what, that's what neighborhoods are all about. So excellent job. Please keep the momentum going. And to Paul Johnson's done a terrific job. Uh, I, I can't express how wonderful it's been. And uh, hopefully we will have all of our city as one big city that will work together and recognizing everybody's little um, idiosyncrasies and, and needs and uh, um, um, ex you know excellent uh, abilities that are in every community because those are things that we don't always grasp every day and by you sitting around the table with all of your uh, residents and people interested in being involved these come forward so thank you thank you everyone So with that committee, may I have a motion now to approve the recommendations contained in the report. Councillor Collins moves it. Second by Councillor Johnson. All in favor? Yeah. Carried everyone. Thank you. I'm going to move on now to item 7.2. It's uh, and call on Mr. Tim McCabe. He's going to present his 2013 economic development business plan. Deputy Mayor, just before we get started, uh, Ed Vander just uh, handed me the end of the year confirmed uh, building permit value stats. So we're at, we are officially a 1.5 billion, so 1.5 billion dollar year. So that, that supersedes our previous record of 1.096 billion in 2010. So it probably changes Bill Jansen's presentation because he said, um, Accomplishments, I think you put 1.3, so. Anyway, so we're, pl we're pleased, uh, Madam Deputy Mayor, to, uh, to be able to present our, our, uh, our business plan for 2013. So I am going to make some opening comments and, and then sit down. Uh, Bill Jansen, who's our Director of uh, Strategic Planning Business Planning, is going to really present the highlights of our 2012 accomplishments as well as uh, our 2013 projects and initiatives that are have been uh, you know consolidated and categorized according to the three um, strategic priority areas within the city strategic plan so madam deputy mayor this uh, plan and economic development uh, business plan uh, this is our seventh year as a department doing business planning um, it is our third business plan, uh, so um, it's our third three-year business plan that we started in 2006, even before the corporation had its, its own uh, strategic plan. So this year is a little bit different because we all have business plans now. You know, under Chris Murray's uh, leadership, all the departments have uh, business planners presented to you back, I believe, in November as a consolidated version with direction from committee and council to get into the details uh, by presentations of each of the departments at the standing committee. And because my department reports to you know two or three standing committees, we felt that GIC would be the best committee to, to deal with all of our uh, uh, department needs. Um, so business planning, it's, it's really dear to our heart, uh, Madam Deputy Mayor. It's something that we constantly monitor and uh, you know we get the work done uh, in terms of uh, what we say we're going to get get to do. So business plans are key to ensuring effective implementation of the city's strategic plan. 
So you can see the, the hierarchy here of our, our vision and our strategic plan. So you have to ensure as a, as a responsible department, responsible corporation, that the strategic plan just doesn't sit on a shelf. So the question is, how do you implement it? So the implementation is really done by strategic business plans, which I would categorize uh, what's before you today. So you have your vision, your strategic plan, then the business plans uh, that specifically detail uh, the projects or the strategic initiatives that make everything come together in terms of achieving your strategic plan. So I know this council loves having a document where it says who the staff lead is, when's the project gonna uh, start, when's it gonna be completed, is there budget implications, what are the other departments that are involved in order to make these projects successful. So it's all there before you and I think uh, it's good as a first crack that all the departments use a similar template so that uh, um, certainly we, we as, a, as a department can now um, integrate better with the other departments in terms of our initiatives that uh, because you know slowly but surely we are breaking down silos and we are one happy uh, department here in terms of SMT we depend on each other to make these things happen um, so that's what's before you today uh, most importantly if you see the hierarchy here is what happens after this business plan so, you know, responsible manager, responsible leadership is, is all related to performance management. It's performance management of your teams and it's performance management of individual uh, employees. So you need to break these down, right down to uh, an individual performance uh, appraisal of a, of, a, of a staff person where they have their portion of the pie that they're responsible for and they're judged on that in terms of their performance at year end. So all of this, so all of our um, 167 objectives that you see here as a department gets filtered down to, uh, to all the staff that are involved with this. Uh, and it's not just a management driven uh, work plan. It, it, it is uh, integrated throughout all parts of the organization. So we have a total, uh, Madam Deputy Mayor, of 167 uh, strategic uh, pr projects. And we all know that, uh, um, and staff do not like this fact of the strategic business plan, but we all know the day-to-day -day responsibilities of most of our staff are not part of this business plan. So you don't see issue building permits, you don't see process rezonings. You don't see, you know, maintain museums on here. This, this is what's expected of us and this is what our day-to-day -day responsibilities are primarily to do. So these are strategic in initiatives primarily. And I would say we're at our limit. We're at our limit as a department in, in terms of uh, capacity to take on other major initiatives like this, major projects. I would say we're close to borderline um, in terms of over-promising. Hopefully we're not. Um, you know, we need uh, lofty objectives to, to reach for in terms of uh, ensuring that we're moving this city forward. Um, and I would, uh, lastly, I would just give a bit of a caution, uh, Madam Deputy Mayor, is if committee and council, as the year progresses, start to add major projects or initiatives that come out, we have to seriously look back at this business plan and delay other projects or take other projects out if that's your wish. So, I mean, it's a, it's a work in progress too as we move through the year. We know priorities come out of the blue, council directives come out of the proof, out of the blue, but we have to have an understanding with you that if you want us to take on new uh, major projects uh, that aren't in here, we're gonna have to go back and maybe delay some other projects. So that's how it works. It's worked uh, really good for us uh, as a department. I don't think we could uh, work as a department as effectively as we do without it. So I'm going to uh, let Bill take it uh, take it over from here, uh, Madam Deputy Mayor. All our directors are here to answer any questions with, with respect to detailed projects uh, that are assigned to their division. And uh, again, I'm very happy to uh, be able to present this uh, in terms of a uh, seventh year in a row. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman, uh, members of committee. Uh, I, I want to start off a little bit by putting uh, the business plan in perspective with service delivery review. We just completed our service delivery review and uh, we have a total in the planning department of five services that have been, uh, five uh, 
types of services that are related to the program. So uh, of 11 programs that the city provides, five are, are uh, provided uh, with uh, planning uh, development department input. Uh, those programs are development, growth, uh, and, and the services that fall under the development and growth uh, program is land use planning, development approvals, zoning bylaw review, business development, urban renewal, and growth management. Under the public safety program, we provide uh, services relating to building permits, building inspections, bylaw enforcement, animal services, business licenses, and school crossing guards. In terms of tourism, culture, and heritage, we provide services that deal with museum and heritage pres uh, preservation, tourism development, and cultural development. Under transportation, we provide our parking operations. And under corporate services, which is our internal service, we provide uh, real property management, building services, customer services, heritage, facility maintenance, and planning and economic development department support services. So under all those services, uh, a number of subservices as well. We've got a total of 20 services with 54 subservices. Of the types of services that are uh, provided, about 29 or about half of them are traditional services. And those are the services that, uh, while not specifically being a legislative requirement, are really what most municipalities do, the business of most municipalities regarding uh, planning economic development. Um, Ten of those services are considered uh, essential for the city to uh, operate. Uh, Fourteen of those, or about a quarter of them, are mandated. So those are the legislative services that uh, are provided. And six are discretionary. Some municipalities provide them. Some uh, don't necessarily provide them. They're not mandated, but they're something that uh, we've had a tradition of uh, providing. In terms of the service levels, uh, about uh, 52 or 88 percent are standard, uh, just uh, 7 percent above standard, and uh, only 5, which uh, 5 percent, a uh, total number of 3 of the 59 services and subservices are identified as uh, below standard. And uh, they're tied to uh, essentially uh, services uh, relating to processing, which uh, time frames aren't uh, essentially uh, similar to some of the municipalities. Uh, and another one would be uh, by law enforcement and parking. And I should note that uh, recent OMBI data shows that that be compatible with uh, uh, other municipalities. So this take uh, this uh, information was from previous OMBI data that the consultants that did the service delivery review provided. So again, a total of five of uh, programs are provided in the department, a total of uh, 11 are provided throughout the corporation. I just want to take a minute to uh, uh, talk about uh, the, the business plan and uh, the status from previous years. Now, not all departments, uh, because they have not prepared previous years, may not be providing this information in the same way, but we went back and took a look at our previous uh, business plan. and. Uh, we have a total of uh, 28 projects not uh, yet started, but 100 of those projects that have been identified uh, are in progress. There's 29 that uh, actually have been completed uh, from previous years. 26 actually have been identified as new projects and one uh, was dis discontinued. Uh, there's a total of 184 uh, projects in the uh, business plan. Tim mentioned uh, actually a little bit less. There was a, a page that was missing from uh, your document. Uh, the, that page has been distributed uh, with the sections. Um, it's tied to uh, priority one section of the, uh, the business plan. The business plan has been um, divided up uh, based on the uh, strategic plan and uh, aligned to uh, the priorities. In terms of uh, 2010 accomplishments, uh, uh, we've been quite busy. And uh, as Tim mentioned, it's not 1.4 billion, but 1.5 billion in uh, building permit activity. And that's kept the department uh, quite busy. Uh, there's a number of other projects I want to highlight. This is not necessarily an all-inclusive list of uh, accomplishments for the department, but rather uh, some of the highlights that uh, we want to bring to your attention. And that uh, align with the strategic plan, so when we look at the um, objectives of the strategic plan. Some of those are, are planning departments. They've been uh, uh, identified uh, here. 
Uh, one of those uh, is the uh, Open for Business strategy, and uh, the strategy has been completed, and there's a number of initiatives in the 2013 business plan that carry forward with implementation of that, uh, uh, that strategy. Uh, we've had uh, OMB approvals of some key documents, the uh, setting sail document, which allows us now to work on implementation on waterfront initiatives, uh, the rural official plan, and the water down secondary plan. Uh, design guidelines have been uh, prepared for our major corridors along with a land use strategy for the B line. We've had a reorganization of the culture and tourism planning division, a comprehensive review of tariff of fees. There's been infrastructure improvements in the Red Hill uh, Business uh, Park which provided opportunities for Nav Navistar to locate. There's been uh, acquisition of uh, Arvin Avenue extension and that allows uh, improved transportation connections and opening up new lands for development. Uh, and Caster Wilson secondary uh, plan has been uh, completed as well. Continuing on, there has been grading reform in the growth management uh, division. Uh, a uh, mobile uh, tourism application, which is the first of its kind to be prepared. The cultural policy was approved by council in June 2012. Considerable development, uh, or considerable department effort was focused on the establishment of the McMaster Health uh, Campus in the downtown as well. Financial incentives were created to, uh, uh, additional financial incentives were created for community downtowns and BIAs. A Toronto GTA marketing plan was launched. Comprehensive reviews were undertaken of business licenses and rental housing licensing. In terms of the 2013 business plan, uh, projects have been aligned on a strategic priority basis. And the first strategic priority, and much of the work that we do is dealing with a prosperous and healthy community. And it's described in the strategic plan as uh, we enhance our image, economy, and well-being by demonstrating that Hamilton is a great place to live, work, play, and learn. Some of the key projects that are uh, in the business plan that relate to priority one is the resolution of urban OP and the AEGD secondary plan, uh, which have now been appealed to the OMB, waiting uh, the, those results. Uh, the preparation of a new zoning bylaw focused on rural zoning, commercial and mixed use zoning, and background work on residential zones. The implementation of industrial land banking program that will create opportunities for additional employment activities. Various servicing and road infrastructure initiatives in our business plans, parks. Undertaking a bayfront industrial area secondary plan and a strategy that will examine our older industrial areas and opportunities for redevelopment. An agricultural action plan that will look at the official plan and our zoning bylaw to look at added value uses in our rural areas. A tourism visitor strategy along with a revamped tourism week program. Uh, we're gearing up this year for uh, much work around War of 1812 signature events and community com commemoration. And then phase three launch of the cultural plan, which will include completion of recommendations and implementation strategies of the plan. We're also looking now that setting sail is completed for a 10 year waterfront capital budget program. This will allow us to align resources and finances similar to what has been done in the past on the downtown. There's preparation of urban design studies and development strategies for Pier 5 to 8 and the Barton Tiffany area. A waterfront official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment for the waterfront recreational area, which is the Bayfront to Pier 7 area. A review of the downtown secondary plan, which is currently underway and will be completed this year. The preparation of urban design guidelines and implementation strategy for James Street and Centennial Parkway, which is identified as our nodes and corridors area. A residential intensification strategy, which will implement our targets for the urban area. 
and a strategy which will define where and how intensification will be provided in the city. The completion of secondary plans for the Fruitland Winona area and the Strathcona neighborhood. The completion of an inventory of the city's cultural heritage landscapes and a review of taxi industry accessibility. Priority three is identified as leadership and governance. And that's, sorry, my apologies. Uh, priority two is value sustainable services, uh, which is described as we deliver high quality services that meet citizen needs and expectations in a cost effective and responsible manner. Key projects in our business plan that address priority areas include an online system for digital submissions of applications and permits that implements the open for business strategy. And it should be noted that this is tied to the web redevelopment project. So once the, uh, the we have a new web operating, we can start to bring on these uh, digital systems. The development of customer service indicators and measurements for the planning for planning applications, undertaking a museum visitor, non-visitor survey, an assessment of parking man of the parking management program, and updating the downtown parking study, and the preparation of a cultural report card. Priority three, leadership and governance. And that's described as we deliver high quality service that meets citizen needs and expectations in a cost effective and responsible manner. Key projects in our business plan that address this priority include an online system for digital, oh, my apologies. Uh, key projects in the governance and leadership uh, include uh, participation in the review and comment on various planning uh, provincial legislation. For example, we have uh, a new provincial policy statement that we've been participating and commenting on. There's amendments to the growth plan targets and policies and upcoming uh, plans include uh, more detailed growth plan uh, review and a green belt review. Uh, there's an archaeology management plan that uh, is being undertaken with considerable consultation with Ab Aboriginal communities, so there's another consultation uh, process going on. Uh, with uh, HR, we continue to review workforce demographics and look for the future, and then undertake a review of policies and practices in the, in the building division. So this doesn't end here, as Tim mentioned. It's an ongoing uh, review and analysis. It's a flexible document that's subject to change as new projects take place, as leads perhaps change, as people change jobs, uh, as uh, uh, projects uh, perhaps uh, morph a little bit uh, over the duration of, of the work. We continue to uh, adjust and change uh, the plan as needed. We'll prepare an update in 2014. And uh, in those plans, if any financial uh, requirements are needed to undertake uh, those projects. Capital bus sub budget submissions may be prepared and brought forward. And then as Tim mentioned, the plans are also implemented through the preparation of divisional plans. Some, some divisions are now preparing their own plans uh, that uh, are even more detailed than department plans and individual performance appraisals are actually uh, also undertaken. That concludes our presentation. It's, Tim mentioned the directors of the department are on hand to uh, answer any questions that you may have about specific projects. I should mention this is also the other the opportunity for uh, council to add specific projects if we're not included uh, in, in the business plan. I think this is uh, an opportunity to do that as well. Thank you, Bill. Excellent information. Great news on our uh, um, building department uh, success for 2012. I do have a speaker's list. I'm just going to read off now. I have Councillor Johnson, Councillor McCaddy, Councillor Farr, Councillor Jackson, Councillor Powers, and Councillor Collins. Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, and thank you very much, Bill, and kudos to staff for the 1.5 million. I'm sure we're going to hear this uh, billion, sorry, 1.5 billion dollar permits. Um, so I wanted to be the first to to jump on that bandwagon, but I don't believe Bill will be able to answer this one. It's more uh, geared for Mr. Sergi or, or Mr. McCabe. With the $1.5 billion permits, as you know, in July of two, uh, 2012, on the 22nd, we had massive flooding. Yesterday, we had another reoccurrence of this. I had 15 sites throughout my ward from one end to the other, and I have the second largest ward in this city. And I went to places where there were 
new road that just got built. Never had flooding before. 14 homes got flooded yesterday. Areas in Bimbrook Village, not even on the Google Maps, were flooded yesterday. Development in the initial stages in Mount Hope, the existing homes surrounding it, flooded. So my concern is $1.5 billion, hallelujah, this is so wonderful, and I know how much work that the staff has done. But my concern is that the infrastructure, is it all right and is it catching up? Because in my opinion yesterday, as exhausted as I was going home with wet feet, I really had to question that. So through you, Chair, to, to Tony, do you have any comments on, on what's happening out there and why we're running around trying to make up for all this wonderful news? Through the chair to the councillor, um, I guess in, in terms of uh, Bill's presentation, uh, that uh, this falls in line with what Tim had said uh, previously. These are the things that we look on a daily basis. We have to stay on top as part of our daily activities. In, in terms of where we're going with the process, right off the bat, uh, the evolution of stormwater management and how we do land use has progressed significantly over the last uh, five to ten years. We do significant studies up front in terms of sub-watershed studies before we get into uh, developing the implementation plan. And those are the critical elements that we have to continue to do that as opposed to looking at very site-specific uh, issues, <clears throat> we have to capture everything on a global and then start drilling down into the uh, limitations within our uh, infrastructure and things like that. I'm not too familiar with the areas that were impacted uh, as a result of the thaw and the rainfall, but those are uh, serious concerns that both us and Public Works have in terms of the capacity of our existing system and how the form of development and how land use comes forward. That is part of our day-to-day -day, um, work plan and uh, we take those very serious that we have to make sure that the form of development that we're approving, the infrastructure is adequate to support that. In terms of going forward, that's why we sort of stop, we look at and make sure that we're using the appropriate standards. Uh, I mentioned it uh, in the past that a lot of the other municipalities are coming to us because we are increasing our standards significantly uh, and we're continuing to look at those impacts of uh, what has been cliched, known as climate change and things like that to ensure that our standards and our interfaces that we're building between our existing system and our new system are adequate to support the form of development and ensure that we actually continue to grow in a responsible way. And thank you for that and through you, Chair, to Tony. With all due respect, Tony, I've been getting emails from people who have lived in their homes for eight months, brand new homes. This is their second major flood now that they're experiencing. And they are questioning why there is still development happening behind them when they're experiencing existing problems today. So what is my answer back to them? If we say that we're going by our standards and our standards are okay, somebody who's lo losing their house insurance now because this is now the multiple flooding that they're, they're experiencing, doesn't buy that. So what can I say to our residents going forward that we are doing our best to protect you even though you keep experiencing these problems? Through the chair to the councillor, um, as I said before, I'm not aware exactly if there were overland flow routes, if there are alterations of uh, uh, overland systems or side yard swales or anything else like that. Uh, ultimately, uh, our standards and the way we're proceeding um, should be effective. In terms of if it's a recurring thing, obviously we've got to stop and look at those and we take them all seriously. We've been trying to engage uh, the residents that had previous impacts as part of the July flooding to ensure we actually understand what is occurring over there, but by all means, uh, please refer them to me uh, and we want to look at what actually has occurred, whether it was surcharging or was it uh, overland flow routes that have impacted them, but for the most part, everything scientifically should be accounted for. As part of our review, we've engaged external people to help us to do the assessment to ensure that as we're going forward, we're actually uh, protecting the citizens. Thank you, uh, Tony. One last comment, if I may, through you, uh, Deputy Mayor. When I look at things like intensification, when I look at uh, the other ones in here, sorry, I'm going to catch into this. It really makes me 
residential intensification strategy, when I start to look at that, and then we have the, the waste management, we've got the public works, we've got the grading, everybody has to come in together and say, this will work, this will not work. Because nine times out of ten yesterday, it's been new development coming up against existing development. And just for the record, at the last planning meeting in, I believe it was November, we actually tabled a 174-unit development in Bimbrook because we still don't understand what happened and now we understand there's even more problems. So this is where my concern is. I'm not here to deter development, but I want to ensure that the development's not impacting negatively on existing homeowners and new homeowners in the future. So I just wanted to put that out there. Thanks for your questions, Tony. I know I caught you off guard a little bit this morning doing this, but I was just so frustrated yesterday. I just, I didn't even know what to say to the people. Just call risk management and I'll, I'll get back to you. So we'll have to work together on this one. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McCaddy. Thanks, uh, Madam Chair. Thanks very much, Bill, for the presentation and uh, congratulations on the uh, building permit uh, numbers. Those are uh, very impressive and I expect those will continue to, to uh, be articulated across the GTA and elsewhere and through, uh, through Neil's uh, ECDEV work and uh, all the materials we've seen show up on the Global Mail and Toronto Star and other, uh, other uh, things that really help uh, the profile of, of our city. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, I guess uh, my question uh, is related to cultural heritage. Uh, and uh, as you know, uh, Bill, we've had some challenges over the last, just the last month or so, uh, month and a half or so, with uh, buildings that uh, had not been, uh, that were included in, in the list, uh, the famous list or inventory of 7,000 properties uh, post amalgamation that we have that were properties that are uh, potentially significant uh, in all the different. Uh, areas across the city. Uh, the challenge we have is uh, a number of those properties are indeed very significant uh, and uh, as you know through the process the building department, uh, building, building code act, uh, should someone apply for a demolition permit for those properties, they, uh, that uh, demolition permit must be, as in mandated, uh, must be issued by the uh, chief building official within 20 days. Uh, provided the information uh, uh, there for him to review that uh, permit. Uh, he's required to issue that permit. Uh, and that process, uh, Madam Chair, as, as you know, uh, as, as Bill knows, is, is entirely behind closed doors uh, just through the Building Code Act. That's, that's the way the process is set out. So uh, in many cases, uh, none of us know, and certainly the public doesn't know, that a demolition permit has been uh, applied for uh, for a significant uh, properties, uh, culturally, cultural heritage significant properties across the uh, city. So my sense from a planning department perspective, Madam Chair, is that's, that's not good planning or not the kind of planning we'd like to see. Uh, we tend to be uh, fairly open and uh, transparent through the Planning Act and uh, making sure that people are aware of, uh, of significant properties. I know we do that on the natural heritage side of things. We're pretty, uh, pretty up to speed on natural heritage. But on cultural heritage, we've uh, we've fallen behind a, a wee bit, uh, and in fact, we we still haven't uh, rationalized that list of 7,000 properties, Madam Chair. We've looked at about 1,000 properties downtown, and that study is coming forward uh, sometime in in 2013. Uh, and I believe there's a motion of planning committee tomorrow to uh, to try and advance those properties onto the register, so at least they have the 60-day. Uh, protection should a uh, demolition permit be requested for those properties. So just uh, going through the uh, business plan here, Madam Chair, that we have in front of us, I, I'm uh, a bit concerned that there's not a lot of emphasis placed on uh, trying to uh, rationalize those properties. And in fact, we may be in the same situation as we have been on a couple of properties in 2012, where uh, people find out uh, at sort of at the last minute and uh, and the building, the uh, demolition permit is poised to be uh, issued, uh, resulting in a large uh, response through the media and all the other ways that you'd want to protest uh, if, if that kind of development is being proposed. So I guess I'd, two things, Madam Chair. I guess I'd like to ask uh, the planning department uh, through Bill, yourself and Bill, uh, how we're going to deal with that kind of situation in, in 2013 uh, I'm aware of the downtown 
initiative, and I'm hoping we can act on that tomorrow at planning committee. And I guess I'd like to offer the help of the Municipal Heritage Committee too, Madam Chair. You sit on that committee, and we've had a, a brief discussion about this. And I think there's uh, a way for those properties to be analyzed through that committee, rather than hiring consultants, uh, money we don't have to hire consultants, to uh, and, and the, and the, uh, the long uh, period of time that that takes to, to review through using a consultant. Uh, that's uh, evidence of that is the downtown initiative that's been a couple of years in the uh, in the offing, and we still don't have that information. Uh, and in fact, the properties uh, on King Street East uh, would be on that list and would be recommended to be on the register, but uh, of course they weren't because that project had not been completed. So maybe just a quick comment because uh, I don't anticipate there's there's much there to to talk about from the planning department uh, on cultural heritage, just from my experience. And uh, maybe just a request that you work uh, with the Municipal Heritage Committee to try and uh, move these uh, projects ahead or, or the, uh, the analysis of the list ahead as, as soon as possible so that more properties can be placed on the register, at least providing that 60-day uh, process uh, through the Ontario Heritage Act uh, should a uh, demolition permit be requested. A comment, please, Madam Chair, on that. Madam Chair, through you to the Councillor. Uh, yeah, the work program actually identifies two uh, heritage projects. One is the, the downtown project that you mentioned. Um, the other project is uh, an inventory of cultural heritage landscapes, which are also important, not just buildings, but uh, landscapes and identifying those landscapes and taking appropriate action. Part of the day-to-day -day work of the department is uh, to look at the designations and to move forward with uh, identifying those properties. There is a list of uh, properties that are being examined and, and looking uh, at uh, undertaking the proper work to move it forward to either on the registry or moving even for, further to uh, on, uh, on the list of designated properties uh, for protection. Uh, Paul Mallard uh, may also want to comment on uh, uh, the, our current program for heritage properties. Paul? Through you, Madam Chairman, to the, uh, to the councillor. Uh, in terms of the work program, uh, we do have the downtown built heritage inventory that Councillor McHattie referred to, and that's approximately a thousand properties. That was part of a uh, process approved by committee in terms of going out and the downtown was to be the, more or less for lack of a better term, a pilot for the overall 7,000 plus properties in the city. We have completed our, uh, our database collection uh, with the funding of a position that was approved by committee through the, through the budget process. We were able to hire a special staff person to do the inventory. We've done that. We're in the process now of uh, transferring the second phase of that project over to uh, Anna Bradford's group in culture and tourism with the reorganization. Part of our challenge has been, uh, has been with resources and dealing with the day-to-day -day work as well as these large-scale programs. So that transfer is taking place in terms of that. We have additional resources to address it. So the next phase of that will be to take that inventory that was done, establish appropriate criteria for further scoping down the number of properties that have met any one of the nine various criteria under uh, provincial guidelines in terms of designation process. So we are moving forward with that. As I said, the first phase of the program is done and uh, ex expected that we will have the, uh, the second phase of that done by the end of the year. One of the other issues of, of uh, just moving all of those properties uh, to the register in terms of, uh, of a, a stopgap until we complete the process is that committee made it very clear to us that in terms of anything going on to the register or designation that we bring forward, that there was to be public consultation done with the property owners that are affected. So there, there's a very uh, large time element involved with that, and if you were to just simply move them to the register, that would be done without the consultation that committee clearly directed us to follow. So we have a process, the project is, is, is well underway, and as I said, we've completed the database and uh, we'll be moving forward this year to complete that uh, downtown inventory. Madam Chair, uh, on I appreciate that answer, but unfortunately that doesn't provide me any comfort whatsoever. Uh, it's my uh, sense that uh, tomorrow any of those uh, properties on that list, a demolition permit could be applied for uh, for any of those properties, and that would be issued roughly within 20 days uh, as per the, uh, the Building Code Act uh, mandated. 
Um, so the, the, the concern is, and I, I don't hear the concern being expressed by the, by the planning department in terms of proper planning, that, uh, that we could lose any and all of those properties, uh, that you know, it's not gonna happen logistically in terms of the 7,000 properties, but we could lose all those properties uh, uh, tomorrow if uh, demolition permits were applied for, uh, uh, for all those properties. So I, I just can't see how that's proper planning, so I'm trying to, trying to inject a sense of urgency uh, and I'm not uh, seeing that uh, reflected back from the planning department, so I, I may be on the wrong uh, track. Um, if that's the case, I guess we'll just simply try and uh, proceed on a case-by-case -case basis. I, I think the Municipal Heritage Committee has the expertise to go through those uh, through that list of properties and identify whether they uh, they meet one of those nine criteria. And remember, we're not talking about designating properties, which is a definitive uh, uh, thing that uh, definitely affects uh, development uh, and what someone can do uh, with their property. We're simply talking about placing it on the register, placing the properties on the register, which provides a public process. So if we're interested in public process, I'm hoping that um, I can work with the Planning Department and the Municipal Heritage Committee to, uh, to see as many of those properties uh, placed on the register as possible, as early as possible in, in 2013. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Farr. In uh, just on the last comments in preparation for tomorrow's planning uh, meeting, as you know, uh, Madam Chair, sitting on the Heritage Committee, as referenced by Councillor McCaddy, um, I did a little bit of research, and the uh, building department tells me that uh, on average we've had four demolition permits issued each year over the last five years, and that's just in the downtown catchment area. Works out to be about 40 every decade, and uh, with a limited list of around 750 in the core, look forward to tomorrow's planning discussion. On today's presentation, first of all, great presentation. Uh, easy to see why the, uh, the template has been um, built, borrowed, or, or uh, used, adopted. Um, across the board with various departments. And congratulations on the 1.5 billion. I think uh, maybe an obvious question for those who may be uh, watching at home, Madam Chair, uh, first of my two questions to Bill, unless there's sub subsequent questions from the answers. Where does the 1.5 billion go through you? Well, the 1.5 billion is uh, spent on uh, construction value, uh, it's uh, creating new uh, jobs, both on the construction, long-term jobs that uh, are there, the residents that uh, are, are created in the community and uh, provide an overall enhancement uh, to the city. Excellent, excellent answer. <laughs> Uh, timelines on, on, on point five, page five on point three, the OMB approval for setting sail. We all know now that the uh, final appeals are, are over. Uh, and uh, with respect to the setting sail secondary plan, which I, I believe a lot of us feel is most significant, most important, and particularly here in the uh, downtown waterfront area, I'm wondering about timelines and I'm wondering if it's appropriate to ask you here, Bill, through the chair uh, today, if uh, that would uh, be provided to us maybe in a, uh, GIC setting or a planning setting, but uh, should we not um, be reported to as a, as a council with respect to um, uh, how these timelines relate to beginning the processes, because there's more than one that fall under the setting sales secondary plan. There's the North End Transportation Management Plan, which we can now get going on. We can start urban design studies over in the West Harbor. Uh, we can start looking at maybe uh, temporary occupancy as uh, the good work from the Open for Business subcommittee has embarked upon as it relates to the catchment area of the setting sales secondary plan and maybe providing things such as leniencies toward parking accommodation for new startup businesses in that. So all of this stuff, um, I can tell you, Madam Chair, uh, some of the residents that I've spoken to and business people in this ward are, are champing at the bit. They're eager to get going. And I'm wondering where is the appropriate time to uh, request of you and staff in planning and economic development to provide our uh, committee or this GIC uh, some timelines on how to get going through the chair. 
uh, through the chair to the councillor. Um, yes, I think it's quite appropriate at this particular uh, juncture as we complete uh, or the, the setting sail is actually now in force and we can actually move ahead with implementation and there has been uh, discussions that are happening uh, in terms of uh, implementation. Uh, in fact, uh, there was a plan or there is a plan in place to uh, carry forward with a presentation to Planning and Development Committee about setting sail project and uh, timing uh, for uh, new projects that uh, can come out of implementation. In the work plan, there's a number of projects that have been identified, and I think you've already mentioned uh, a number of those. It's uh, dealing with design strategies, the waterfront recreational area, preparing an official plan amendment, uh, official uh, zoning bylaw amendment, undertaking uh, works that have been identified uh, for the waterfront, uh, implementing the uh, traffic uh, calming strategy. Uh, so. Uh, I think it's quite timely now at this particular point that we can prepare an update for Planning and Development Committee on that particular project. That's great. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks for the presentation, Bill. Thank you. Councillor Jackson. Thanks, Madam Deputy Mayor, and Bill, very good presentation. And Madam Deputy Mayor, just a few uh, comments with kudos and three questions I have, but the kudos from the front line right up to the directors of this Department of Planning and ECDEV. Uh, we have a tremendous department that's doing such great work and of course uh, we are extremely blessed to have the leadership of General Manager McCabe. I think sometimes we may just take him for granted in terms of all the successes and I just want to compliment him and all the great leadership he's shown here. Uh, tremendous accomplishments, uh, Bill, and I just want to say the Museum Visitor Survey, thank you for highlighting that. Uh, thank you, Anna Bradford, our new merge director of that division, for highlighting that. That's something that I've been after for a number of years. I know we've done surveys from time to time, but to have that highlighted <laughs> is, is important because I think that whole area of the cultural aspect of also having the economic benefit to our community sometimes gets lost. The 10-year waterfront capital budget and waterfront OPA and, and zoning bylaw amendments and all that in conjunction with the Port Authority, the Waterfront Trust, all good work there that we're doing to continue that momentum, Bill. Um, so, Bill, the three questions I have now, Madam Deputy Mayor. The uh, AEGD, the Airport Employment Growth District Secondary Plan, it's all at the OMB. Um, I'm sensing it can go a number of ways, Bill, in, in, in light of the number of appellants that are there. Do we have, pending the decision, do we have a fallback plan in case, and I know where my position has been consistently all along with it, do we have a fallback position in, in place by staff in the event of council's direction, approved direction, isn't forthcoming? Madam Deputy Mayor, through you to Bill, maybe just a general comment on that? Through the Deputy Mayor to the Councillor, Right now, actually, uh, today is the start of the OMB hearings for the AEGD. Um, it's just started at this particular point, and I think uh, what's being presented is, is the council position at this, this particular point. Uh, there are a number of projects that highlight uh, employment uh, initiatives above and beyond the AEGD. So we're looking at continuous investment in our uh, existing employment areas. We're doing a Bayfront uh, industrial area secondary plan as well to look for opportunities for enhancement of the Bayfront area and opportunities for uh, improvements uh, there. So not all the eggs are in the AEGD basket, but uh, rather there's uh, other opportunities that have been identified and projects that have been identified that spread those opportunities uh, through throughout the municipality. So if I'm interpreting Bill, Madam Deputy Mayor, you're saying full steam ahead, hoping we get what we desire and what we've approved. If not, we have other eggs in the basket. And if we get um, sidewinded, if you will, by the OMB decision, it'll be kind of like a regrouping by staff to bring that kind of a report back to uh, this body. Madam Deputy Mayor, through to Bill. Uh, through the Deputy Mayor of the Council, uh, that is correct. Uh, I have to do point out that the province has established employment targets for the municipality to achieve. Uh, we do need additional lands to be able to achieve those uh, targets uh, based on uh, a provincial requirement. So we would have to look at uh, those opportunities and, and kind of regroup, as you say, and uh, come up with another strategy. Thank you, Bill. Second question, Madam Deputy Mayor. I see no reference to the TCAC, the Trinity Church Arterial Corridor. Uh, Councillor Clark Johnson and I in the last year have coalesced uh, all the various departments and staff finally bringing everyone together in all players type of um, meeting uh, around the table in the last year and uh, Councillor McCaddy's been there as well from his uh, chairmanship of the HCA 
don't even see any reference to it here, Bill. And you said, Council, if you want to add any projects, well, I don't need to add this one. But I do know it's, I hope it's on the radar, but I got concerned when I didn't see it here. Maybe a status update, Bill, Madam Deputy Mayor, through you to Bill? Or whoever wants to? Yeah. <laughs> I think Tony can uh, assist with that. Mr. Sergi, always enjoy listening to you, Tony. <laughs> through the chair to the councillor, uh, it's highlighted in, uh, I believe it's uh, a 1.1 continued growth of our uh, non res, but. Uh, well, on the um, Reader's Digest handout that Bill went through, I just didn't see it referenced. Yeah, it's uh, page two of six of 1.1 continued to grow our non res tax base. Uh, as I'd like to provide as an update, uh, there was a subsequent meeting held, uh, I believe, in December. Uh, possibly uh, Councillor Clark might have been in attendance to that as well. Or was it Councillor Ju uh, Jackson that was in attendance? Uh, the ongoing discussions, I believe they've, uh, with the discussions with the Conservation Authority, they've narrowed down uh, a corridor that they would like to go ahead and try to implement. Uh, both uh, the private landowners, we're going to go back and look at the options to implement uh, in order to move it forward, and along with the corridor or Trinity Church Road design for its ultimate and the stormwater management required to be uh, facilitated, facilitated as part of the corridor. Uh, Public Works, uh, Gary Moore and I have met as of probably about a month ago, along with the developers, engineers, to ensure that all things are captured because it's tied into both uh, Highland Road, Stone Church Road, Upper Mount Albion, so we're looking at it very comprehensively and we're still hoping to uh, proceed uh, this year with the corridor construction. So, Tony, if I heard that last comment, that's encouraging. You're saying hopefully all things go well, all conditions met. We may actually see a shovel in the ground this year, Madam Deputy Mayor, through to Tony. Is that what I heard, Mr. Sergi? Uh, through the chair to the councillor, that is our target. We would like to see something going on this year, yes. That's tremendous. And for those, I'm sure all my colleagues are familiar, but those listening live stream, that's from the extension at the top of Red Hill at Paramount Stone Church, right back through Island Road, uh, Rymel Road, and zigzagging up through the business park. That will not only open up more assessment growth business park area, but alleviate a heavy residential traffic from a lot of the nice residential streets up there as well. Last one, Bill, and I have great sympathy for Councillor Johnson. Unfortunately, again, what she went through this past weekend and growth management, but you put up there on page eight, Bill, if you could just quickly go back, can you, Bill, to slide eight, please? Uh, that's the one, third bullet from the bottom, residential intensification strategy. Again, I I'm, hate to say this at nauseum, but as we are trying to control uh, urban and suburban sprawl, as we're trying to manage better growth development, in those areas that we heard from Councillor Johnson today. A number of files have come before this body, this term of council and residential intensification, and there's been tremendous community, neighborhood, and ultimately this council's pushback. So folks, I'm trying to understand which way we want it. So Bill, can either you or Tim give me some ideas to what you mean by residential intensification strategy? Madam Deputy Mayor, through you to Bill. Uh, through the deputy mayor to the councillor, uh, the growth plan, provincial growth plan requires that the municipality provide 40% of its uh, new development in uh, the existing built area by 2015. So we have a target of intensification and providing intensification. The growth plan uh, has strong emphasis on intensification as well as our uh, urban official plan. Uh, but it doesn't mean that every project and every development is intensification. We believe that we have to undertake a strategy to identify where and how intensification uh, is appropriate, provide uh, design requirements uh, for those intensification projects, and hopefully that will assist committee in making decisions around intensification rather than hearing every time, well, it's intensification and you have to uh, support that. So we're looking at a bit of a strategy around that. We also would uh, see a strong public education component on intensification as well to help understand the requirements of intensification and get feedback from the public as well in terms of uh, how we should provide for intensification in the municipality. I'm encouraged to hear that, Bill, and I guess with any applicants coming forward as well, maybe we can get Madam Deputy Mayor ahead of their proposal 
so that if they're saying under provincial policy, they could do the maximum, but we know that's going to cause a backlash in the na existing neighboring community. Let's get ahead of that if we can, Bill, with staff, with the applicant, to say, you know what, here's probably that what could be acceptable within this range instead of trying to max it out because of provincial policy and just I mean we've been through a number of these this term and I've supported all my colleagues from the various wards who have had neighborhood pushback on intensification but it was supposed to be the panacea but it's not but I hear Bill what you're saying you guys have retreated a bit and said we need an overall strategy so I'm encouraged thanks Madam Deputy Mayor thanks Bill thank you Councillor Councillor Powers sorry Thank you very much. Thank, thank you for the, uh, the update. Uh, a few questions, Bill. Um, Metrolinx is proposing the, uh, the big move and kind of the evolutions in there. I'm assuming that that's ongoing involvement, I, or perhaps it's hidden in one of these titles here. I just need kind of the assurance that we're keeping our eye on the, uh, on, on the ball and making sure that we optimize our ability to uh, to, to be involved in the in the process as it as it happens, could I get assurance or otherwise or whatever? Uh, through the deputy mayor to the council, yes, you have our assurance. We uh, have pro uh, programs in the, uh, the the business plan that uh, look at uh, development opportunities uh, along the B line. We have a strategy, and we're looking at uh, implementation of the strategy. Uh, there are a number of corridors uh, that uh, have been identified, as well as nodes, and uh, we're doing work uh, that. Uh, hopefully will enhance uh, future investment for GO stations as well on uh, James Street and Centennial Parkway, which uh, uh, is probably going to happen sooner rather than uh, some of the other initiatives from Metrolink. So those uh, programs of examining James Street and Centennial are in the 2013 work program as well. And we continue to work with Public Works uh, on their work with uh, Metrolink. Okay, thank you. Uh, my supplementary question, well, another question, not necessarily to you, might be to Mr. McCabe, is on page three of your slides, you've identified, I'm going to call it, 59 areas of involvement. This is with regards to service uh, levels. When we did the service uh, um, delivery review, uh, we, um, we noted that it was about 150 some odd services. Um, some of them had no standards whatsoever, so my question is, has standards, the terms of reference and standards been established for every one of the uh, um, service deliveries that we're providing through um, planning and economic development? Um, Madam Deputy Mayor, uh, if they haven't been, we're working on it. Uh, so we did develop a list when the service delivery review first came out. So I can't recall, uh, Councillor Powers, where we are with that, but we understand the importance of it and, and we need we need performance measures in order to carry out proper evaluations. Okay. So thank you for the assurance that there that will be in place. Um, my final one, and um, Mr. McCabe, I think you very subtly suggested the the challenges, all the tasks before your department, and uh, and and at times you may be encumbered by the demands of council. I think uh, to assist yourselves, but to assist ourselves. As things come off the blonder and things such as that, perhaps you keep us in in the loop. Perhaps a, uh, a semi-annual consent agenda report, just plain saying where you are. You know, an acceptable level might be that 25 percent of a particular project becomes kind of an ongoing, but it kind of takes off. How should we say? Decreases the burden so that we might be. Uh, I mean, we're still going to ask you. But uh, if, if there's capacity within the planning department in order and economic development to absorb additional tasks in that, perhaps a state of, uh, state of the union relative to uh, planning and development will, uh, will assist us to assist you. That's my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Collins. Real quick, um, Madam Chairman, through you to Bill. Bill, you mentioned earlier the um, secondary plan for the industrial area in the lower city, and uh, that's something I've advocated for for a number of years. And just curious to know the timing of that. And, and um, you know, image is one of the biggest issues we have as a corporate priority, and it's one of the hardest problems to solve because it involves so many moving parts. And that view of the industrial skyline over the, over the uh, skyway, 
uh, certainly does us no favors. And, and while you know the industry has been very kind to us over the last hundred years, it's it's built this city. Um, you know, many would say that that old type of K industrial zoning um, certainly does us. Uh, it does do some harm in terms of, of the image factor, and, and I'm hoping that that uh, secondary plan will go a long way to establish some standards um, where we've literally lived without any rules or regulations. And, and so I'm, I'm curious to know the timelines and, and how will council and the community be part of that? Because it's such, a, I mean, there are neighborhoods there, but there aren't a, there's not a lot of residential um, in the heart of, of that industrial area. So how, how is that publicly communicated and how is the community involved in that process? Uh, through the deputy mayor to the councillor, the intent was to complete it by year end. I have to say, I just found out that the planner that was responsible for that work is, is left, um, the corporation. So we have to uh, reallocate uh, resources uh, to the project. Background work is happening at the moment. Uh, consultation, while not on a, a residential uh, ability, not, what we've done with other neighborhoods in terms of residents. We are doing consultation with uh, the stakeholders uh, in the community, major employers, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, other uh, business uh, in terms of the opportunities. Uh, we've also been talking with the uh, uh, Port Authority as well about uh, opportunities. Uh, so right now the report is in a background phase. Uh, with the collection of the background, uh, and then uh, it will be a uh, consultation options development uh, phase that will uh, short, start to happen uh, fairly shortly, and as a, the, the business plan identifies it to be completed by the end of the year. Okay, and is there a way to marry that with the um, environmental roundtable that we talked about earlier? I'm sure a number of those groups, while those individuals may or may not live in in close proximity to, to that industrial area, they certainly have a, an interest as stakeholders uh, as it relates to improving the environment. And I see the secondary plan as a big part of, again, establishing some limits and some rules and regulations in an area that uh, um, certainly has lived so long without them. Through the Deputy Mayor, certainly that's an opportunity that uh, can be provided through the project development. Thanks for that, Bill. Thank you, Councillor Morelli. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I, my questions actually have been answered now. Uh, I was interested in the, the concept of intensification as well as I'm working uh, with uh, Chad uh, in the uh, north end. I just want to make some comments, though, Bill. Great representation. Certainly, I think uh, the uh, permits speak for itself and certainly indicate clearly what's going on in, in the city and certainly uh, where we're heading. And, and I want to just uh, salute the work. Uh, in particular, I, I want to draw attention to the fact that uh, not only is this work pretty critical in terms of the overall picture for me, but uh, I just want to draw reference to the importance of the work that uh, we're going to begin uh, in terms of Barton Street, undertaking the study to uh, to revitalize uh, in that area. Certainly, uh, I'll be working again. We're, we're part of that. I want to salute the, uh, the good work of Glenn Norton. Uh, in terms of uh, our participation being now with the new charrette coming forward and a number of activities to certainly uh, make that corridor uh, develop in the same fashion as um, in, in a very similar fashion to that which has taken place in Lock Street. And, and we see the continuous development on Ottawa Street where I'm working with uh, Councillor Marula and, and the streetscape plan. So I want to just salute that work and, and make sure I haven't uh, always agreed with, uh, especially in the intensification area, uh, where I think we need to, to do further work with, with staff in terms of understanding the, the uh, inner city. And, uh, but I, I generally and overall, I, I just look at the terrific multiplier effect that can occur given the, the, the fact that if we develop, say, Barton Street <coughs> even further, uh, and I look at potentials like 440 Victoria North, where we're currently in the process of uh, moving forward with that project, I can just, uh, just want to make sure the message is very clear uh, that um, it's uh, it's a very productive to uh, returning uh, areas that have since received some you know difficult uh, challenges uh, back to some form of vibrancy. So I want to salute that work. Um, the last point I make is uh, obviously uh, Councillor McCaddy's talking about uh, various uh, historical properties. I think part of what I want to make sure is is done is that I have no difficulty defining 
properties as, as historic and, and looking at uh, you know whether we should or we shouldn't be demolishing them. But I, I would also hope that people that are in, involved with that piece of activity would also come back with trying to find ways and show ways of how they'll finance maintaining those projects because that's the other piece uh, to focus as much on how we're going to be able to keep them as much as we are to say define them and, and, and say we want to keep them for these reasons and we, we think this is the way to do it. So they're the comments that I want to make and uh, but generally want to just uh, speak to the part department and say thank you for your cooperation. I'm looking forward to the work that we're going to do on Barton Street. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Clark. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, Trinity Church Extension, uh, given that there seems to be some um, semblance of, of an agreement here between all the parties, including the developers, how quickly can we actually have the documentation back to Public Works for approval so that we can get moving on this? And if I may add to it while he's taking his seat, and what other documents do we need? I'm thinking specifically in terms of will there be any change in the water flow towards the wetland on the corner of Highland and Upper Mount Albion? Through the chair to the council, I'll try to answer that uh, in three parts. Uh, first, the Trinity Church Road is an approved capital project that can proceed uh, once the details have been resolved in terms of uh, elevations. The corridor was already purchased, was dedicated to us through ORC in their process. So the land has already been established. So it's a matter of doing the details, and that's what's been in the holding pattern for the last couple of years, ensuring that uh, we well, look at The costing at hasn't been approved for the corridor yet, Madam Deputy Mayor. Through the chair, I believe I thought we had a capital project already established for the uh, uh, for the, the capital project for Trinity Church Extension. The corridor was a slightly different item. It was it used to be a pathway. Now it's a large eco corridor, the approximately one point seven million dollars more. Through the chair, the Trinity Church Road was a capital project. The corridor would be part of the development application that has to come forward, and then depending on how the land use is reoriented may require uh, amendments to the plan that will have to be brought back forward. So those are the issues that we're working on in terms of the corridor itself. You're 100% so correct. I'm trying to just make it clear. Does this council have to approve the additional cost to build that corridor to the larger size that we're talking about? This is specifically to allow deer to transplant the wildlife and, and people. It was a, a combined corridor now from what used to be a relatively small pathway. So does it have to come back here to get approval for that money? Through the chair to the councillor, uh, once we get the detailed costing to make sure that it falls within what was projected as being the capital budget cost, if it exceeds, then obviously you're 100% correct, then we would have to come back as part of the capital project to enhance the cost and uh, look at where the uh, revenues are going to come from to pay for that project, yes. Okay, so for the record, all intents and purposes, it's moving forward. We've got agreement from the private developers in terms of the land and their way of, of dealing with it. The HCA is comfortable with it. The three councillors, is, is that what I'm hearing? Through the chair to the uh, ward councillor, uh, they've had positive discussions. Uh, we're waiting for confirmation from all parties to make sure that it's properly papered and so that we know exactly which role everybody's playing and how it's going to come forward. Uh, primarily it's going to be the landowners to the east that are going to lead the process because that's going to establish the outfall. With regards to the wetlands, that's part of the uh, discussion that we're dealing with both our staff and the Conservation Authority in terms of how we're going to service that entire area, yes. Okay, so I look forward to the second part of that. Um, the other component I did want to bring up just quickly, um, I, I, I have to agree with Councillor uh, Johnson with their concerns about flooding. Um, I am seeing a significant increase in the number of flooding in my ward in brand new neighborhoods. Not old neighborhoods, you know, 10, 30 years old, brand new, they're built next year, there's flooding. And I know, uh, Mr. Sergi, you've been working with me on a number of them, and NEHID has been, been fantastic in trying to resolve what the issues are, and we've had to hire two different consultants now, one for the Nash and, and or, sorry, the uh, Jasper and Bland neighborhood below the mountain, and now, of course, up on the mountain, um, in the Highgate area where flooding came out of nowhere. This past 
weather event, which was not really significant, and we've had bigger snow melts. Councillor, uh, or I mean, Madam Deputy Mayor, you know this from being from Stony Creek. Uh, Green Acre Park flooded. The creek overflowed its banks completely, and and it was quite a serious flood. Now, the reason I'm raising this is I'm, I'm getting more and more concerned because because my ward right now we're seeing significant development being done all at the same time, and I share these concerns and put them on the record time and time again. What is the accumulative effect of all of this development happening, and how do we know that the stormwater management ponds are going to actually help mitigate, mitigate the flooding? The opposite's happening. I'm seeing more flooding. So do we have a program in place where we're actually monitoring the new construction to ensure that what we approved in planning in terms of grading, A, was done completely, and do we have a program in planning to monitor to ensure that the proposed the, the proposed water process that we have, the, how the, the, the storm water is going to be managed, is actually working? Because I'm having more and more concerns that it's not doing what it's supposed to do. Through the chair to the councillor, uh, uh, very good question. As it comes to the implementation of these master plans as they're adopted and, and proposed, uh, any significant, actually all infrastructure, that is constructed by the private proponent must be certified to ensure that it met the specifications as through the um, uh, servicing strategy, i.e. if the pond calls for 10,000 cubic meters of storage and active storage, they have to certify that that volume is actually working. We're going back and looking at uh, all our as constructed, constructed uh, as submissions to ensure that they are being certified by the engineer on record as they fit in comprehensively to the overall strategy. So yes, we're looking at that. Uh, the point are all, if I may, Madam Deputy Mayor, because I know we're short on time, are all the stormwater management plans that are proposed for each development peer reviewed? Through the chair to the councillor, I would say probably only about 10 to 20 percent are peer reviewed. Most of them are reviewed with us and the various authorities as they're submitted at draft plan and as part of the implementation of their engineering servicing strategy. So um, let me ask a, a question that perhaps will, will by some may seem cynical. Um, if the developer's main uh, reason for doing their work is to maximize revenue, which means minimize costs, and how do we know that the stormwater management proposals that they're putting in place are actually meant to handle the higher volumes of water that we're seeing, including the volumes of water that are being added to it from neighborhoods that are being developed at the same time? Uh, through the chair to the councillor. Uh, our staff, and that was part of our restructuring, we centralized uh, last year, the year before last, I believe, all stormwater review under our infrastructure planning group, understanding the level of expertise and risks associated with that. So we have it under our infrastructure uh, planning group to review all stormwater. Uh, basically what we've done as part of that was that the guys that are reviewing the applications have to bring it to our stormwater group to make sure that it fits within the overall global servicing strategy and they ensure that the volumes and the design actually meet. Uh, what you'll have is, it's a, you raised a very good point, obviously uh, industry wants to maximize on their yield and those are the discussions that uh, you'll continue to hear that we are delaying them because we're trying to make sure that the design actually meets the need uh, not only for their development but to protect the abutting properties and adjacent properties so we do review the stormwater reports in terms of the design in-house with our engineers and also in conjunction with the uh, overall servicing strategies part of the subwatershed. We bring in consultants on a time-to-time -time basis where it, they have more of the uh, ongoing history in some of the areas plus uh, to deal with the overload of applications that we may have from time to time. Uh, 
Um, so, Madam Deputy Mayor, I'm not going to ask any further questions. I, I will make a couple of statements, and I'm hoping some of my colleagues are, are hearing my concerns. Um, the developers are maximizing the time for themselves, and they're shifting costs to the neighboring developers. They're doing that because that's how they're going to make more money. So they want to get their development done as quickly as possible, least amount of cost. We don't want to have the giant stormwater management pond. It's his problem. And I've sat in meetings where they've been arguing back and forth over whose pond it is. You have also, Madam Deputy Mayor. So we see that happening. And then we also see them shifting those responsibilities and blaming, quite literally, the neighbors that have existed in the neighborhoods for 10, 15, 20 years. It's not my fault. It's their problem. They, they put in a bean garden. How dare they? Now it's flooding out the entire neighborhood. And I've had those explanations given to me. So I've got two different neighborhoods now that I'm wrestling with with, develop, uh, with with consultants that we have hired. Both of them are finding serious problems with the grading that's causing the flooding. Issues that should have been dealt with years ago that have not been dealt with, we are correcting that. But now we have this new problem with brand new developments. And we're seeing significant, and I mean significant flooding into basements. I had one brand new home, it was in, she had an indoor pool and she didn't want one. It, it, it was just ridiculous. And it was overland flooding and it was because of the grading around it. And now we have to go back and you know what I'm talking about, Mr. Sergi, we're now working to fix it all. I think we need to have some type of task force or, or committee, including uh, counselors on it to look at the ramifications of the developing happening so quickly to look at how we ensure that we're not putting in stormwater management ponds on the cheap so that homeowners in the future end up paying for it out of their own pocket in their backyard. I've been wrestling with this for some time trying to fix them in neighborhood by neighborhood. It's not working. Staff are working with me trying to fix those ones, and we are. But as quickly as I fix this one downtown, I've got one uptown that shouldn't be there. It's a brand new neighborhood. They shouldn't have flooding. It's impossible, but they do. So to my colleagues who are also having those issues, I think we really need to get our heads around how we, we form some type of committee to look at this more proactively. Yes, you've got staff point people that are now dealing with it, that we didn't have dealing with it in the matter five years ago absolutely great and they are good staff. They jump right to it to deal with these issues. But there are more systemic problems that are occurring. I've got 5,000 homes popping up in upper uh, in my ward in Upper Stony Creek. All in the same neighborhood with the water flowing the same way. Where do you think it's going? So it's a challenge and those stormwater management ponds, they're not holding it. They're, 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 some have actually breached the bank. So there's an issue. I'll leave it to my colleagues to see if we can come up with some type of proposal to have staff work with us to try and fix it permanently. Thank you, Councillor. I have Councillor Ferguson, then Councillor Whitehead. Just a few quick points. Number one, on the issue of the flooding in new subdivisions, I'm fortunate uh, in Custer's has been a significant growth area and I haven't experienced any. The, uh, our, our retention ponds are flooding and doing exactly what they're supposed to do. A lot of people are concerned the soccer fields floods, but they're supposed to because they're combined soccer field and, and retention pond. But just a suggestion to my, my two colleagues to my right who seem to be experiencing this with new development. Uh, you know, we've been listening to the debate, listening to our staff response. Maybe we, sometimes you can't see the forest for the trees. It might be appropriate that uh, if we pick two or three locations where new subdivisions have flooded, have a peer review done by that by an outside engineering firm report directly to council, get another opinion because we can't allow this to go on if in fact it's true that new subdivisions, brand new subdivisions, are flooding. Just a suggestion. Uh, just through you now, Madam Chairman, to Bill, just uh, can you go to slide eight? I think one of the other um, accomplishments we had and, and priorities we had that's working that you haven't identified there is the one-stop shopping. That's working very well. And, and uh, I, 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 I want to keep that, I think we should keep that in the forefront because they're first point of contact for someone who walks through the door. And we got to make sure that staff are, because they do all the back work, we got to make sure they're being supported when they go to the, the maze of departments, that they're getting the information and the response that they expect, and they are right now. So we need to celebrate that and make sure we stay on top of that and identify that in the future. 
on the issue, uh, uh, one of the, the negative things I keep hearing out there is turnaround times for zoning, OP, and site plans. It'd be nice as one of your priorities that we could start to measure that and publicly be out there with it. So we can, when we get challenged on it, we can say, well, here's what our staff say they're doing. They're turning it around in six months, three months. But it, uh, it, that came out in the open for business discussion. But I'd like to see that out publicly. Let's be held accountable for how long we're taking to turn around. And, 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 and maybe we're not being told the actual numbers by some of the people who got applications in. And the last thing, I'm just going to get one more pop at this, is I don't think we should be celebrating the new fees that we put in place if, if we're so inefficient that we have to double the two big ones, which is rezoning and official plan amendments. And I'm not talking about the impact on developers. They're big boys. They can handle it. But on the Wilson Street uh, secondary plan, and I probably have the wrong slide asking you to put it up there. I'm sorry, slide five. Slide five. You can see we're, we're celebrating the comprehensive tariff of fees review accomplishments. <laughs> you know, by doubling fees, I don't think it's something we should be celebrating because uh, it could impact that first line of the 1.4 billion down the road of our fees becoming uncompetitive. And, and I know council supported that, and, but I'm going to give that one last kick. And, and as I say, I'm not, um, I'm not worried about the developers. The Ancaster Wilson Street secondary plan got done. It was a very long, comprehensive process, and I have a number of people who are anxious to move forward in, in you know, I have a boutique hotel, I have some financial planners, uh, doctors, and to go from five to $10,000 now for that rezoning is a lot of eyeglasses they gotta sell or a lot of eye examinations they gotta do. And, and so those are the people I'm concerned about, the small single shingle operators that have to pay 10,000 bucks for a simple rezoning which is fully supportable in the new secondary plan. So I just wanna put those three items out there. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Whitehead. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And just uh, dovetailing on uh, Councillor Clark's comment, I couldn't agree with him more. In fact, since I was elected, uh, uh, there was a lot of huge growth in Ward 8, and a lot of it was adjacent to uh, old neighborhoods, and Tony can attest to it. It's been my pet issue because I've been putting out fires ever since because of uh, impacts in old neighborhoods. The other issue, of course, is uh, um, We've been told through the search committee, because we did bring a search committee in, independent uh, individual panels, and they uh, they made some recommendations, and they did talk about the uh, ferocity of the rainfalls we're seeing and the amount of rain falling in a short time frame and, and the ability to absorb uh, the rain and that the coefficients that we use, this just provincial standard or whatever the engineering standard is, uh, is outdated relative to the, uh, the type of climate we face uh, and the type of uh, experience uh, that's being um, reflected in the last number of years. So I would hope, and I think it is strategic, quite frankly, um, to take a look at how our performance measures are in the context of storm management on new development, where the issues are, are percolating, excuse the pun, uh, what is the, uh, uh, whether or not the standards we've, we've, we've initiated are meeting uh, the objectives and whether changes need to be taken, fundamental changes, quite frankly, in the way we calculate things to ensure that, uh, uh, that new development is taking care of their, their water and it's not creating uh, any other issues or problems for others, as well as taking care of the residents that are in those new developments. And I don't think we've done that kind of measurement, performance measurement, assessment, analysis, and I think that uh, it, it'd be great to have some kind of report come back even, and I don't mind the uh, striking the subcommittee because I think it is an issue that keeps on coming and, and coming and, and, and a lot of us are getting tired of hearing and putting off individual fires when we could maybe take a comprehensive approach to it. So I certainly support that initiative. Secondly, um, I want to reiterate some of the, uh, the first of all, I really appreciate uh, the, the performance, overall performance of, uh, of our economic development, uh, our planning and I, I really appreciate uh, the comprehensiveness and certainly kudos to, uh, once again, uh, attaining uh, $1.5 billion in, in building permits. Uh, one of the, the, the reinforcement pieces I, I want to, and I think some councillors already spoke to it, of course, is, is the intensification um, strategy. And I want to ensure that, and I'm not sure if that's just done in, uh, internally with staff or, 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 or again, is this something that we can create a subcommittee of, of, of councillors? Because far too often um, on the planning committee, we experience long, long meetings as a result of, uh, of, of, of plans coming in that may not meet the character of a particular, especially in infields, especially infields. And it's not consistent with nodes and corridors because uh, they're not nodes and corridor. 
So uh, uh, there seems to be a disconnect between uh, uh, what staff predominantly pushes in the context of infill versus where it makes sense in regards to the intensification targets. Uh, and that's also consistent with the grids. And that's our, our nodes and corridors. So uh, maybe we can shorten our meetings if we can uh, uh, have a better strategy and maybe engage not just staff, but maybe some councillors on that discussion and then uh, bring it back for uh, support by uh, the balance of council because uh, that really does tie a lot of uh, time up, not only in staff, but certainly whether it's on Ontario Municipal Board hearings, uh, neighborhood meetings, uh, planning meetings, and maybe uh, if we could do a better job, uh, not only educating, but uh, surely understanding the objectives and the expectations, we might be able to uh, cut cost on, on that front. Uh, the other thing is uh, I, I wanted to um, highlight that, uh, that uh, I think this is the first opportunity, I think, since we had that report that came out that had us number 14, if I remember right, on the uh, economic development and, and the methodology that was utilized. I uh, was just looking at pure numbers of uh, permits uh, and gave value to that versus the actual assessed assessment value of those permits and what it would create and the jobs it, it would create. So uh, I think this is the first time, if I, I could stand be correct, but I think this is the first time we formally have a committee meeting that we could address that issue versus uh, what we've heard it, uh, or read in the media. So could I ask through the chair to Neil, so that for those that uh, maybe not caught it in the media, that you can provide absolute clarification on your discussions with those who uh, did that particular survey, what their understanding is and what we might see in the future uh, and how they apply that survey. Yes, uh, through Deputy Mayor, um, we actually um, had discussions with CIBC World Markets about that. In fact, what they were measuring was the number of permits versus the value of permits. So, for example, uh, uh, an A&W restaurant in Calgary would carry the same weight as uh, Maple Leaf Foods' $400 million investment in the city of Hamilton. So they're going to make that change. They also use percentage changes, which aren't really particularly accurate either because, for example, if we had 500 million residential uh, uh, permits and then the next year, which is a fabulous number, the next year we had 550 uh, million permits, the percentage uh, change would be fairly small versus uh, you know, a municipality that went from $1,000 in permits to $4,000 in permits. So that's why it's very important to use the value and they are going to make those changes. I wanted to get that on record here to the committee since, since it, uh, it's been pretty well talked about outside of council, but it's the first opportunity that you present that here before us. Uh, just two other things I, I, I came up. One is uh, I noticed you got downtown secondary plan. Since I've been elected here, that's been on the list. So I'm trying to understand how many, uh, can you provide some clarity to me and how long we've had the downtown secondary plan on our, uh, on our sheet and why, why is it taking 15 years or whatever to do it? Um, through the councillor, or through the chair to the councillor, uh, this is an update of the uh, last downtown secondary plan. It's probably about uh, 10 years ago or so. Uh, it's timely to update that plan and undertake a, a review of that plan and provide uh, uh, guidance based on uh, what's happening lately in the current context. So it's actually an update of uh, the previous uh, plan that was prepared. It was called uh, Putting People First. I appreciate that. I guess what, what, what I'm trying to understand is that there's a lot of taxpayers in this community that expect the same level of service. There's many areas of the, the community expect secondary plans to be put in place. And all far too often we're told we don't have enough resources uh, to do that. But I made this uh, an issue year in and year out. And I don't know what the strategy is in regarding the secondary plans. I don't know how they're prioritized, how the resources are allocated, how the work plans are, are constructed. But it seems to me that the predominance of, the, uh, of this work is being done in Lower City and not on, the, uh, on the, in any other location in the city, quite frankly, other than Wilson Street, I guess. So I, I'm trying to understand what is the strategy. Help me understand how you set those priorities and how we allocate the resources. Uh, so I'm comfortable that we're not spinning wheels in one area and leaving everyone uh, in its wake. So could you help me understand and appreciate that? Um, through the deputy mayor to the councillor, uh, priorities are set based on uh, 
a number of deeds. One of those could be where development uh, could be cur uh, occurring, so where we have our boundary expansions or new areas for development, we need to have secondary plans to provide guidance for those particular areas. Other areas, there may be large redevelopment projects or changes that occur, and that those areas warrant themselves for uh, redevelopment. In terms of the downtown, there's been much focus uh, over the last uh, 10 years. There is now a provincial requirement uh, for the downtown in terms of employment and uh, residents. Uh, it's a target. It's called an urban growth air, uh, center, and uh, we've identified that in our plan. Uh, we try and uh, through grids and uh, the official plan, there's been identification of nodes and corridor areas where uh, focus has been on um, creating secondary plans for those areas and providing growth. So those all can contribute to identifying where areas uh, uh, are of concern and where secondary plans uh, could be undertaken. I think the uh, Paul Johnson's neighborhood uh, strategies and, and work is uh, also an important component of that where uh, ne not necessarily land use issues in neighborhoods but uh, other issues that need to be addressed through a consultation process and the development of a plan. So I think those fit quite nicely with strategy for secondary plans in terms of priorities and uh, where efforts should be focused. I appreciate that. So is there an actual uh, uh, a list from year to year or the next five years that a councillor can get their hands on to understand what staff have identified uh, as prior? In fact, I think that should come forward to all councillors uh, so we clearly understand. And then if there's questions in regards to the priority, at least we have an open discussion. But I, I, my, my uh, experience is uh, anytime I ask for a secondary plan uh, anywhere in the mountain, it's, it's uh, sorry, we just don't have the resources. I'm tired of hearing that excuse. So I'd rather have a strategic, uh, comprehensive uh, understanding of the process and where their priorities are, and then I can question those priorities. Without, but without it being in front of me, it's very difficult. So I would ask and request that in the future. Last one is uh, the, the, the official plan. One of the pet peeves, uh, and I, I think any, every council has probably experienced this on at least one application, and that is uh, um, we automatically, within our official plan, request uh, any road windings. Road windings in regards to development. And it's impacted on churches, it's impacted on businesses, it's impacted on uh, nonprofit organizations, and it's become a very uh, uh, difficult and challenging piece for many organizations in this community. So I would hope, and I had asked this before, uh, since it is a business development component, that we take a review of that policy and understanding that there is, is a need. I'm not questioning at all there's a need, but I don't think we, there are areas that'll never ever, in fact, we're wide and we made it uh, shorter. There's areas will never be widened because of the cost of uh, uh, building new bridges and et cetera. So I, I need to understand if we can really, is there an opportunity for us to take a re review that policy and then uh, really identify the areas of concern in regards to uh, the need for this policy and, and take off the areas that we understand is not really uh, something that is um, prudent moving forward so that we can open up uh, and, and make it less intensive for development, businesses, churches, and et cetera in our community. Because we've been dealing with it in some cases one-off, but it has always been a costly venture for those organizations, a timely uh, issue for those, those organizations, and uh, quite frankly, uh, and more times than enough, uh, the the, the, the uh, city staff have, in, in fact, capitulated and understanding uh, uh, that those particular areas. But we haven't dealt, we've been dealing with it as one-offs. So I'm just wondering if we can deal with it more comprehensively so that we need not continue taking up staff time and, and or those organizations or those private sector t um, time. So I would ask that to be part of the, uh, the consideration going forward. And at, at planning, I guess I'll, I'll ask for something more formal in regards to uh, how we can do that. Appreciate it. Thank you, Councillor. And to that, I have to, uh, Councillor Powers, you want to comment with regards to the road widening dedications, and I know Mr. Mallard would like to comment on the uh, secondary plans, correct? So, Councillor Powers? Yeah, on the road widening, as you recall, Councillor, there was, uh, the issue was raised during the open for business, so it's one of the items that are on the agenda, so as part of our discussion is the review of the, uh, of the impact of the, uh, of the road widening, so it's, it's in the process, sir. Mr. Mallard, with regards to secondary plans, sir? 
through you, Deputy Mayor, to the Councillor. I just wanted to remind that about two years ago, we had done a uh, secondary plan report. We met with all the councillors and we identified the priorities for those. So I will forward that report to, uh, to Councillor Whitehead. Thank you. I now have Councillor Marula and then Councillor Johnson second time. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Mayor. And just uh, briefly, it would be remiss of us not to um, focus in on some of the pos a lot of the positives. And I know that the storm event was brought up in a negative manner, and and I never would ever minimize the impact of, of flooding anywhere in the city. But I must say, though, Madam Deputy Mayor, that we need to commend uh, all involved with respect to the fact that in my area, I, I went uh, floodless entirely. So uh, just a few short years ago, we would have seen probably five to 7,000 households flooded. So we've come a long way, and I think we strive to eliminate it entirely, but we have really mitigated and or eliminated the flooding issue. Now we have to work on some of the new developments that have occurred, and I know that everyone around this table is, uh, is focused and committed to, to doing just that. So uh, it would be remiss of me not to have mentioned that, so I, I thought I'd highlight that this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate that, Councillor Morell. Councillor Johnson. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. And I just wanted to let uh, the committee know that uh, Councillor Clark and myself are going to go through the process as far as this peer review is concerned. Uh, we're going to bring it to the Planning Committee because this falls under the Planning Committee's uh, purview. So we'll put a notice of motion together tomorrow to have a peer review of three different uh, locations just to give us a, a cross section of, of what is happening out there and if in fact things are, are what they seem to be. So just to, wanted to let our, our uh, colleagues know that we won't do anything today but we will be bringing something tomorrow to the planning committee. Now that we said it. <laughs> Thank you and that ends the uh, list of speakers appreciated. I just want to again I'd like to thank Councillor Marula for his comment on uh, on the uh, storm event yesterday. I also had issues I know Councillor Johnson and I spoke of it this morning on our way in together and ironically where I am these were existing neighborhoods that I've never ever had flooding issues at before so it just puts a different perspective in. Uh, on situations and uh, I have no idea what's happening. I'll be very honest. I had an area where um, it's actually an inf infill of a very large piece of property with four houses built brand new within the last two years. All had backflow preventers. All got flooded. This is really scaring me people. So I know I will be dealing with staff but uh, I don't think there's any rhyme or reason with the storm event yesterday and um, you know just trying to alleviate fears of residents. I can understand them out there but to our staff who were there. I know I was at the operations center in Stony Creek. Um, staff were out doing everything they could as fast as they could and they did a tremendous job. So hopefully the comments here today get to them that uh, they deserve to be commended. They did excellent work as far as I was concerned. Thank you. So on that note, I'm going to ask then, uh, may I have a motion to receive the presentation? Thank you, Councillor Johnson, Councillor Partridge, all in favor? And approve the business plan as presented. I'll do the same, Councillor Johnson, Councillor Partridge, move it. All in favor? Yeah. Carry. Now with committee's indulgence, it's uh, 20 to one now. Our next is uh, public hearings and delegations and our next um, presenter will be Stephanie Roy McCallum from Dialogue Partners. I'm wondering if the committee would like to have, say a 10 minute break, because uh, it's going to be a long period when we start dealing with this for the rest of the afternoon. And Madam Clerk, will you be remaining so that someone will be here keeping an eye on our, our materials on the desk. So with that, shall we break for 10, 10 minutes? Is that sufficient? 20 minutes, 1 o'clock. Everyone back here for 1 o'clock would be greatly appreciated. Thank you, everyone. I'm on the slow. 
Thanks. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs>
many of them, as you know. And I...